the uh, first item on the agenda, um, in lieu of not having the executive director's report, or minutes of Wednesday, September 4th, is there a motion? Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, September 4th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, before we get started, I'm going to call on our general counsel um, to discuss an issue that uh, Member Holmes brought up uh, at the last meeting, and that is um, the treatment of the three network hospitals as one. And he asked Mike to do some legal research into the statutes of whether or not that was possible. Mike, you could give us an update. Um, so I, I don't think um, under our current statutes that we can establish, uh, basically what I understand is the board is interested in establishing a budget uh, for the network and allowing the network to um, set the individual hospital budgets for the Vermont hospitals within the network. And um, our hospital budget statute, 18 DSA 9456, requires the board to establish the budget for each hospital and requires each hospital to live within the budget established by the board. Um, and I think effectively it would be delegating some of that authority to the network. Um, agencies can delegate authority, but there has to be um, an authorization from the legislature and either express or imply, and I don't think we have that here. We do have a delegation statute that allows uh, the board to delegate powers to staff or individual board members, but it expressly prohibits delegation of um, language. The authority to make final decisions in regulatory matters, which I think this is because the statute directs the board to, um, like I said, establish a budget individual hospital. So um, I think if the board wanted to, to go down this route, the, the thing to do would be to get express authorization from the legislature to change the statute um, and put it on the guidance committee. And I would say the board um, might wish to go down that route, but we certainly would go down that route unless you be able wanted that route to be taken. So that's something for you to be able to uh, think about. And uh, um, there's time. <laughs> so thank you for being here. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the hospital budget team. And we'll proceed with um, trying to make some more decisions. Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. My name is Patrick Rooney. I'm the Director of Health Systems Finance for the State of Vermont. To my right is Agatha Kessler. To my far left is Kelly Thoreau. And to my near left is Lori Perry, uh, all of which have been integral in creating um, this process as it has moved forward. So today, to give you a brief overview, this is our <coughs> agenda. We're going to continue with Northeastern from Monday's hearing, move on to Mount Scutney, and then we'll work into um, a discussion on Central Vermont, uh, which came in on Monday. Uh, Lori and Agatha will be discussing that with the audience. <clears throat> Port, uh, Porter Medical Center has a projection update that we will walk through along with provider transfers. And then from there, with all that information, we'll move into the networks, various hospitals for deliberation and or approval. So with that, we move on to Northeastern. Um, staff really have nothing further to say on this matter. There were some additional items that were requested from Northeastern, which were provided late yesterday to the staff and then forwarded to the board. So with that, we will turn it over to the board for discussion. So I just want to make sure that all the board members saw the uh, follow-up that we received, including the uh, change. Did everyone receive that and saw it last night? Okay. Discussion from the board. One thing I want to talk about is the, the NPR, and I know you have a recommendation to potentially reduce to the 4.5 and the 5%, but just wanted to make sure everyone was aware 
that um, most of the change from their forecast is occurring in 2019, so they're up 7.7% from their forecast in 18 to their 19 projection. And the 19 projection to the 20 budget is 3.5%. So if we were to go to 4.5%, for instance, that would be 1% over the prior year, and 5% would be 1.5%. So I you know, just want to make sure we're aware of that, um, <coughs> you know, bringing that number down because it, it's against budget when we look at where they're trending from the prior year, would be a relatively low change um, and considering the fact that they've talked about movement you know, from New Hampshire and other things. Um, I know we said some things about EV and stuff, but I wouldn't imagine that that would create just a year over year of 1% in this. So just wanted to put that out um, as we're going through it. So as I thought about this one, this is one that has troubled me because it's, uh, it has seen growth in uh, NPR, and um, I think I acknowledge that they are getting more people through the doors, but the same token, I'd like to see us send at least a token message. And, uh, my suggestion, which may not have any merit, uh, is just to uh, reduce the uh, charge to and that would result in a 0.2% uh, reduction in NPR, if I'm correct, Patrick, is that right? Correct. So that would bring the NPR down to seven. seven. Just a suggestion. Go ahead, Jess. So I have a slightly different suggestion, um, but I think it will actually help the direction that you're going. So I, I am cautious about reducing charges if they're within reason of medical inflation. And so 3.5% is within reason of medical inflation. They themselves have already submitted a way for us to get them to 6.85, if my calculation is right, which it could be wrong. But they have already come in and said that they can do some work in their ED uh, avoidable utilization that saves 310,000 off NPR by They've reduced their uh, budgeted ED visits from 15,000 to 14,000 roughly, and they've increased what they hope to see in their convenient care from 1,000 to 1,500 after questions from the board about avoidable ED visits and what they could do. So that impact seems to be at least roughly around 0.35% or something like that really we're chatting this morning. So I think that gets them under 7% um, at about 6.85 that we can have the actual calculations made. But um, that would reflect at least the recognition that they are seeing the utilization from New Hampshire. Um, and their case mix index is growing, as we've seen from the video from FOSS. And this is real volume. And I don't think they're going to be closing their doors to real volume. But I do appreciate the uh, <coughs> attempt to reduce avoidable ED visits, which they do have some control over. And they're going to put some programs in place to do that. And that does have to be as long as it actually happens. I mean, we've seen NPR above budget this year. But. I'm just saying that's the way to get the NPR yep. down. Other thoughts? Yeah, sure. I, I could support um, having either a half percent uh, or even a percent reduction in commercial based on the fact that they are far exceeding their 2000 19 projections um, and are leveraging some of that to improve their margin. Um, and I still would have a hard time thinking that they would only, even if they went down to 6.8, that would be less than a, a 3.5% and they're a hospital that has been up 9%, 7%, then 2%, then 8%, they consistently exceed the numbers. Um, and, you know, it's an opportunity to, to look at what, you know, what, what leverage they should be getting from exceeding significantly those numbers. Thank you. So a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, Northeastern has um, uh, over the last five years, the highest NPR growth rate of all 14 um, hospitals. 
and it's a very high number. It's a, a 6.4 percent um, compounded average growth rate over that period of time. So I, I, I think that's significant. I also worry a little bit about the shifting from budget to budget to a projection to budget, because there's a little creep in there that if we are, are kind of forgiving um, what happens from budget to projection and then are looking at the calculations uh, um, off of the projected budget, um, <coughs> Yeah, that's one way to get to a, a six percent growth rate. Um, but I, you know, I think if if, if that is, uh, uh, you know, their approach to uh, what they need to meet utilization increases, traffic coming in from the camp, et cetera, on an NPR side, that's fine. But um, I, I, I could support a reduction in the rate um, just to um, uh, give a practical message. Um, this long-term growth rate um, is difficult. And as Maureen has often said, um, if hospitals, when they get in trouble, all of a sudden you know, they can address their expenses. And so having a message from the board that uh, um, addressing the expense growth um, you know, at Northeastern is, is something that uh, should be on the front burner. So I think where I'm at is, uh, I think I also am on board with a small reduction in charge, meaning I think the 0.5 that Kevin suggested, um, which for me uh, will mean that when we come to enforcement time that I will am more likely to, I will definitely want to take that into consideration for enforcement. So. Um, it's not like a double whammy kind of thing, but I I do think that um, we are what we're asking in the all pair model is for hospitals to move towards uh, what is in this essentially a global budget, and our only tool right now to really effectuate that in a fee for service system is to kind of trade volume for charge. So. I think I've been fairly consistent over the last couple of years in my thinking around that. So um, that's why I am supportive of that approach. Um, I hear what you're saying as well, Jess, because I do appreciate that uh, the ED utilization is high. I do want to see them address that. Um, and. Uh, I do worry that ha that that may take longer to implement, um, but I so I'm, I'm what I'm sitting on the fence right now is trying to think through is whether I might support both approaches, which would be a higher decrease. Yeah, um, FYI, if we reduce the hospital's rates affects the gross revenue and usually it flows through to NPR. But if you don't want to have the NPR affected, you should give direction that they should reduce their rate but also take corresponding adjustments to the contractor allowances so NPR is um, net neutral. I would want to, personally, I, I would want to affect the NPR. Yeah, I would want to affect the NPR too. And I, I think also it's to talk about the process a little bit. I mean, um, we've brought up a few times during this course that people can come in for a mid-year adjustment. And, you know, when you're only up by a percent or half a percent, you know, but this is, they're up significantly from where, they're, where they were supposed to come in. They're up, you know, 7.7%. They're up three or four percent over where they were, projected to be. And that doesn't just happen at the end of the year, you know, and this could be addressed earlier rather than wait until at this point and then come in. We're just getting higher, um, you know, higher people coming in and we have a higher NPR. So uh, half a percent reduction is about $185,000, which also should be targeted to additional cost savings and efficiencies. Um, and I would say it would reduce, should reduce the NPR, 
but I also would put out to this hospital, if this continues in 20, which it very well could, because for the past several years, your average has been 8%. So if you really, this number would be, again, from where you're coming out right now, it would be a 3.4% probably change from your current estimate, assuming that's where you end the year at. And every year, for the past several years, it's been, on average, significantly higher than that, 7%, 8%, 9%. And then it, when we come in, it's, it's, we're getting more volume, we're getting more people from out of state, et cetera. So I would just say, um, you know, for this one, let's watch it during the course of the year and see where you're coming in. And if, if in fact, you're higher, come in for a mid-year adjustment and address it at that time. Would anybody like to make a motion? I can move. Um, for us is uh, I move that we approve Northeastern's budget with a 3% overall change in charge and a corresponding decrease in NPR, which I think would be bring them to 7%. Would it bring it just under 7? I could also, we could just say bring it with a corresponding decrease to NPR and allow staff time to calculate that. Okay, so I think the motion would be uh, move to decrease, uh, move to approve Northeastern's budget with an overall change in charge of 3% and a corresponding decrease in NPR to be calculated uh, by the staff and with uh, quarterly reporting on cost savings. So let me just understand. We could lower NPR more by having them do the programmatic changes to reduce speedy utilization as they've already put forth. I, I guess just what we're saying is that each year we've set an NPR limit and they've exceeded it. Mm -hmm. So what faith would we have if we just did the 6.85 and uh, the ED changes that it would actually come to fruition? I think they're going to need to do the utilization, and they should do that for efficiencies um, to get to where they need to be, because this number we're giving now will be a 3.3% year-over-year change to where their actuals are coming. If their actuals come in where they say, and they still could exceed that number, so it could even be a lower number by the time we get, you know, get to the end of the year. And to think that this hospital will be one of the lower hospitals year-over-year -year is is challenged to think that that would, would be, they would be lower than most of the other hospitals. So in order to get to 3.3, and also, you know, budgeting is not a perfect science. So we know there's going to be swings in budgets, and that's, you know, that happens from day one. So, you know, I think they would be trying to make those effective changes um, anyway. Well, so I guess, I mean, I can support this motion to the extent that as I look back on their charges, I'd prefer to have gone the other route, but um, looking at their charges, they've been, their five-year average is actually at 4%, so it's not like we've been overcorrecting and we've been um, had charges that were below multiple inflation or below inflation for the past five years, so it's not the route that I would prefer, but I can look at it. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Is there further discussion? Before we vote, is there a comment from the public? Yes, Bob. Hi, Bob. Bob from NBRH. Just, uh, I'm sorry, say your name again? Sure, Bob. Percy from NBRH. Just a clarification. Are you voting to both reduce the 310,000 and 0.5% or is it just the 0.5%? It's the 0.5% with a corresponding reduction in the NBR. Thank you. Is there other public comment? Dale. I just want to comment on, I picked up on the idea of they know if they're going to be over, not under, but they can figure out halfway through their year if they need to come in and ask for an adjustment. In theory, to make it simple, 
if you realize six months of six months into the year, you're seven percent over. How do you really know that you are going to keep that rate though for the rest of the year? What if you trend closer to zero? We've seen some hospital budgets come in that had some really profound changes over six months compared to the previous six months. And I'm saying it would be that drastic. But then when you average it out, no matter what you saw in the monthly, you might be at 3.5, you might be at four, you might be lower. It all depends on what happened. What if you lose a practice? What if you lose, things can really shift very fast. So I'm a little hesitant to say they can come and ask for an adjustment without a better definition of what that really means. Only a hospital really knows their personality, therefore, if they do have things on the horizon, like a provider leaving or something, or, um, that makes a difference in, in terms of, or a doctor leaving, to put it in simpler terms. So I'm a little hesitant in hearing the conversation. I get it, but does that really deal with it when they come in, or is there more to it than just do they come in? The other one is if they're over in their revenues, is it just about changing all the things we talk about to get them to balance out? I begin to ask myself the question, as the revenue is over, is it really a distribution issue as far as take the revenue and put it where as far as resource and investment? We've actually asked that question before. Is that still on the table? Is that something to be considered at times is if you Accumulate all of these overs. Is that a way of building reserves? Not really. Or is it? Because we know there's going to be fluctuations from year to year. Is that part of the problem? We're, we're trying to take away when we're over, which really hurts us when they're under. End of comment. So I guess my response would be, Dale, that in this particular case, it's not a one-time event, it's a trip. And um, even with the reduction that's being considered, it's double what the guidance was for impact growth. So. Other members of the public? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, new business we have today is Mount Scotty. Uh, their request is 7.4% over their fiscal 19 budget, 6.5% um, over their fiscal 19 projection. Uh, and citing the two reasons for the proposed increase, uh, one was trickle down from Springfield and the other was um, growth in primary care due to restoration of FTEs in their primary care business. Um, other hospitals have also cited the trickle-down effect from Springfield since December. Um, as staff, we, because there's other hospitals saying it, we do believe that patient load is probably finite to some degree. Um, <clears throat> however, when citing their physician growth through the restoration of FTEs, um, they did acknowledge that it will take some time for them to bring those FTEs online, so they are slowly orienting them, which will cause some um, slowdown in, in, in growth in that area. However, they do plan to bring on um, 1, 1,500 patients that they lost um, prior to having those, those uh, physicians on staff. Um, <clears throat> our recommendation here would be to reduce the NPR 4.5%. Their five-year taker is 4.3% on NPR, so we feel that this is appropriate. Um, probably towards the higher range of five to absorb the um, business from Springfield and to get those physicians acclimated to their new practices. Um, leaving the change in charge in place, this is a hospital that is currently running in the red. 
um, and our recommendation would be to maintain that bottom line um, and rebuild um, cash reserves as well. Um, a continued ongoing discussion that we would also recommend is uh, the ACO reserve matter, um, which can be discussed today or continued in the future um, as we move forward. Uh, and that is all on Mount Scott for now. Discussion on Mount Scott, who would like to start? Sure, I'll start. Um, so this is one where we've tried to, we've gone back a couple times and we've asked them to clarify how they're getting to their NPR number. And I understand some of the challenges that they have with a lot of uncertainty around what's happened with the ACO, with Medicaid double payments, et cetera. But just want to be clear that the 1.2 million that, or about 1.2 million of their growth, they're saying is greater than volume slash intensity. And it's due to the annual dish loss, the reduction of other operating revenue, and ACO related expenses. So they've increased their NPR to be able to offset this for what they told us in order to get to a correct operating margin. But they haven't displayed how they're going to get that increase. It's not they've, they've already showed us what's coming from Springfield, where, where it's coming from everywhere else. And it it you know this is what we struggled for when we had the meeting with them. They were um, plugging the number up top, um, not just by by a change in charge, which is not that significant at 3.2%, but they were getting to that number in order to get to the operating margin that they wanted at the bottom line, but they didn't show how they're gonna get that increased volume. So that that's the challenge with this one, I think. It, it's again, you know, a bit aspirational at the top. And, the, and they said, the reason we're putting this number in is because we've had all these things that are impacting us and therefore we need to add it to the top line. So. I support what you're saying with the reduction, and it, this is another one where it just looks like that's where they're trending and that's where they're gonna come in. And we're not trying to say, cut your services, and there was some discussion about what do we mean when we say cut expenses to, towards this. We're, we're trying to not have a Springfield again, to be really blunt. You know, I'm not worried about that so much with Mount Scutney because of their backing with, with Dartmouth, but. You know, when people put these top line numbers up there, because they have expensive loads they need to carry, and they don't get the top line number, they lose a lot more money. And you know, this, as well as some of the other hospitals where we reduced the top line to for Grace and for Brattleboro, those were the reasons. It's saying we, we haven't seen how this trend is supported. So that's what we've been struggling with this, and we got a response again last night, and if I'm reading it correctly, they're saying, you know, the, the rest of the NPR growth, this million two, is really just related to these factors, which put it on the top line, but didn't give us support of, we have higher utilization, we, we've got more people coming from Springfield, that was already all factored in. And I understand their struggle, but just to put a number up top and expect it's gonna happen, and have all the corresponding expenses, that's, that's a real challenge. So, you know, I'm okay with the charge rate, I'm okay, you know, for right now, and part of that, I, I do think there's some conservatism in what they're doing with the ACO reserve risk and what's happening with, with the um, Medicaid double payment and how they're booking that through, um, you know, all things that they cited, and so I think there's just a lot of uncertainty in their numbers, um, but I, I don't see how they'll get the top line. Other thoughts? I'm just going to, I'll concur completely with Maureen, and I think I can say it any more eloquently than that. So my thought is, they've actually backed out what that other uh, NPSR growth is, it's 2.33%. So I would say a trim from the 7.4 minus the 2.3 would get you at about 5.1. So that's uh, where I'm landing. And I also am comfortable with the charge as submitted, 3.2. Other thoughts? I'm comfortable um, with 5 to 5.1 as well. Um, and the charge has submitted. Um, in terms of the ACO reserve discussion, I would, I think that makes more sense to do kind of broadly and not necessarily tie it to this one hospital's budget order. So I agree that we should have that, but I wouldn't necessarily include it specifically in this budget order. It, 
just because we're, we haven't been including it in other budget orders. Yeah, I tend to agree with you on that, Rob, and I think that as hard as we've tried in the past year to try to get some uniformity on how to treat the ACO reserves, it's been elusive. Yeah, and it's ongoing work that we'll need to continue to do broadly with all the hospitals. So um, I'm looking at their, again, five-year trend, uh, and they're one of the better hospitals uh, in the system with a um, 2019 projection over the 2014 uh, growth rate at um, uh, 2.4%. Uh, and I, um, um, like Maureen and others, I, I, I have not gotten clarity on how they're going to get to the top line. And uh, it's, to me, there's two courses to take, is to give them what they ask and then have them come in uh, mid-year um, or after the first quarter and take a look at how they're actually doing once some of the dust settles around this uh, this Medicare uh, build back issue and Springfield and the, all the issues that they uh, kind of laid out as moving parts that haven't aren't resolved yet or to take a more conservative approach and if uh, things do shake out in a way that's faithful to them then respond to it then so um, I, you know, I can, I can give it five percent growth rate. Would somebody like to make a motion? Uh, I move that we increase Mount Escutney's budget with a five percent NPR and two point two percent overall charge. One second. It's been moved and seconded to approve Mount Stephanie with 5% uh, NPR and a 3.2% change in the charge. Is there further discussion? Do you want to make any uh, comments about expenses? Some of our other motions we've had comments about expenditure reductions, expense reductions. Good point. I think to be consistent, we would want to include the same language that we included with the other NPR reductions around uh, concern that the expense, the expenses uh, reflect in some way the NPR change. Uh, but just on that point, I, we did get the letter from a letter from Boz asking for clarification around that. And I just for myself, I thought I would say what I was thinking, which is I see it, it that as an intent kind of uh, statement, but I personally don't want to micromanage how the hospital, uh, what exactly they do. So I don't see it necessarily as, for me, I wouldn't require that it be one to one uh, I would leave that to their discretion and with their board of directors to figure out the right way to address the NPR change. But I think it's important uh, to Maureen's point that she's made throughout the hearing process that uh, expense reduction is of concern to us. So I would maybe express it in the order in that fashion. And I think it, it was uh, right for Jeff Keenan to call us out on that because that could have been interpreted in so many ways, Absolutely. whether it's a dollar reduction or a one for one reduction or what have you. And so uh, I'm, I actually agree with you. I think it should be more of an intent portion and not uh, trying to hold people steadfast to reaching that um, one for one reduction. Um, obviously, it behooves them to try to reduce the expenses as much as possible so that they can try to keep a an operating margin, and without a margin, there's no mission. So, um, does any member of the board object to it being strictly an intent? Uh, no, I'm fine with it being an intent, and I just want to, um, you know, referring also to the letter we got from Boss. The three hospitals that have really reduced their top line have not supported how they're going to get to their top line numbers, and. Of these hospitals, two of the three, uh, if not Modest Company as well, have missed their top line objectives the past several years and then missed their bottom line objectives. And, you know, we did this with Springfield for the past two years. Past what was going on? We said, your number, you're not going to hit these numbers. What's going on? And these hospitals 
are showing the same characteristics. And um, I would actually put out there and hope that um, Voss would be helping these hospitals, these boards would be looking at it with these hospitals and aligning their top line and bottom line to where they can, can realistically, what they can realistically achieve. It's not trying to say, cut your, cut your services, cut what's going on. It's really saying, you haven't shown that you're gonna get these numbers. And when we, we're looking you know, at the trends, at the history, of hospitals that have repeatedly missed their top line, and then those same hospitals repeatedly miss their bottom line because at that point they can't react to changes in expenses. So it's really trying to say, I think it needs to go back to their boards. And again, if, if, if they can really come back and say, oh no, we're really gonna be at 7% when we've missed the past several years, we're 12% for a hospital that's done that three times in a row, come in with numbers at double digits and miss them significantly and then miss their bottom line, that's what we're trying to prevent. And um, just want to make that part really clear. So yeah, it needs to, we're not going to micromanage it or I don't feel we should. It needs to be up to those hospitals to go back and reflect what those expense loads need to be in order to make a margin that you know is sustainable for them. And that big part here is sustainability and making sure that they, they get to profits each year. So just to make sure that I have the uh, protocol and the parliamentary procedure correct, I believe that what I've heard is that the maker of the motion and the seconder have agreed to a friendly amendment for a reduction in expenses with intent language only. Yeah. Who seconded that? I did. Can you agree with that? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, further discussion from the board? If not, I would open it up to the public for discussion. Yes, John. I promised myself sorry, I wasn't. Say your name. John Brumstead. Um, I promised myself I wasn't going to comment today, but Maureen, um, what you just said cut to the absolute heart of the matter. Um, uh, yesterday, or two days ago, Kaiser Family News put out another article about the struggle of rural hospitals. You had an excellent symposium in April. Um, I would riff off your comments that um, the way to address that issue, that adjusting the expense base to uh, be in sync with the reality of the net patient revenue coming in, you heard it from the gentleman from Stroudwater, the only way to do that is to be willing to adjust the bouquet of services that you're providing in your community. And the only way to do that with conscience is to be part of a system. And, you know, I would ask as you deliberate or as staff um, brings forward your budget orders for standalone hospitals that you emphasize the fact that there is a pathway to success here. It's hard. It takes time, look at the Center Vermont story or the Porter story, but it's accomplishable and we have to do, we have to pay attention to the financial realities uh, and um, uh, learn our lessons from where there have been successes in rural America. Thanks. So the good news in this particular case is Mom's company has had those discussions. And, so, and they, have really done a turnaround there some work for so uh, is there other public comment yeah. oh yeah i'm just a question of mr chairman is, is uh does the motion take out the aspirational piece that, that maureen is talking about i'm just trying to, just trying to see if i'm interpreting interpreting the motion for you're asking me to define the aspirational. And I'm what Maureen sure is saying is that some of the, the, some of the increase in net patient revenue is supported by X, Y, and Z facts, and some isn't. And what I'm asking is, does the motion take out the aspirational piece? It takes out what they specifically said was driven from non-volume uh, or intensity-related increase to their NPSR. So it takes that million one out. Um, whether a 5% is still aspirational, 
their history has been in 17, they're up 4%, in 18, they're up 5.3%. This year, they're only up 1.6% um, to their projection, and now next year, they would be up 5%. So history of 5%, I, I think it takes out the aspirational, but you know, we never know for sure. No, well, I know, but that's, but, but that's the intent of the motion. I actually think you could go up to 5.1 and take it out. Thank you. Other discussion from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And with that, we're going to transition here to provide some review and updates uh, on two of the UVM Health Networks hospitals in Central Vermont and Porter. Uh, in addition to that, <clears throat> we are going to discuss some of the provider transfers and counting changes that they have requested, and you'll be able to vote on those as you go, or you can push them back and vote on them with the bikes. And with that, I'm going to turn over to Lori to discuss uh, the updated Central Vermont Medical Center budget. Central Vermont came to us on Monday with a revised projection and um, budget. As of that date, we are seeing their budget to projection variance 19 to 19 is a negative 2.2%. Their 19 budget is still at 211, 387, 021, and their budget request now is 218,247. This is a 3.1% increase over their 19 budget, and it is a 5.4% increase over their 19 projection. Their 19 projection over their 18 actual is 6.3%. This hospital variance triggers the 5% cap that was in our hospital budget guidance. The request is not compliant with budget guidance. The growth rate impacted by requested with the growth rate impacted by requested adjustments. This hospital is asking for 3% overall change in charge and a 5.9% commercial change in charge. The hospital gives their um, justification for this increase in the NPR due to case mix index, unique patients. They're also adjusting their NPR because of providing transfers. They have an accounting adjustment due to reclassification of bad debt collection fees. They're also an accounting adjustment for reclassification of payment reform investments to NPR deductions. Uh, they're saying the change in charge to cover any inflation on commercial business and support long-term operating margins. The hospital's original projection for 19 is shown here um, when they submitted it in July 1st. Then we, we asked them questions on August 9th. They changed their projection from 209 million to 205 million. And then as of uh, this last week is 206 million. So they increased a little bit. The operating margin on July 1st was 678,000. Then on August 9th, they went to a negative 4.3 million, and then that increased a little bit, or improved a little bit of a negative 4 million. The budget for 20 on July 1st was 222 million. We didn't have an update on August 9th, and now they've come in for a $218 million budget. Um, the growth for their budget um, on July 1st with the 5%, and then as of the other day is 3.1%. And I think it would give you the provider transfers. This is a summary of the transfers and accounting adjustments that Central Vermont Medical Center is proposing, and the next week's few slides will break that into more detail, but in summary, you can see that there's three practices we're going to review, oncology, pulmonology, and dermatology, and the effect on NPR is detailed below. Um, so oncology would have an overall effect bringing NPR down by 0.9, pulmonology down by 0.3, and dermatology down by 0.3. The, the um, combined effect of all three would be 1.6, bringing NPR down by minus 1.6%. And then for the accounting adjustments, 
Um, there are two accounting adjustments. One is to reclassify bad debt collection fees to expenses. That brings effectively money out of NPR. So it brings um, their NPR down by minus 0.4%. And then the accounting adjustment works the other way. It's money coming into NPR, and that would affect um, increase NPR by 0.8%. The accounting changes, um, the way that we're looking at this is this is creating the effective Rate. This is the apples to apples accounting of what happened in FY19. If you applied that same accounting practice to FY20, those are the impacts that you would see. Whereas the provider transfers, those are um, justifications for the growth. So the details of this, we'll start with the practices, the provider transfers, pulmonology. Um, in 2018, the Green Mountain Care Board approved acquisition of a pulmonology practice. So it was an independent pulmonologist who was practicing in the community, and he was brought into Central Vermont Medical Center. Um, it was a 0.4 FTE at the time. The inpatient pulmonology, pulmonology practice was brought in at that time. This request for FY20 is to bring on the outpatient component of that. Um, this independent provider is retiring at Central Vermont is replacing them with a full-time FTE. So this is staff who sort of look at this as a follow-up volume. The full scope of the volume is now being brought to Central Vermont Medical Center. The um, hospital presented that their wait times to see a pulmonologist is three to four months. So this would alleviate that access to care issue. So this is, um, you'll see that staff recommend approving this. This would be a uh, 692,000 impact on NPR, and we recommend approving this um, to reflect the scope of the full scope of the volume that was already approved in 2018. Is it the board's pleasure to uh, look at these one at a time and make a motion, or look at them from the entirety and make a motion? I think it actually might be easiest to do it one at a time. I think so too, but I just want to make sure that I'm not. Is everybody okay with that? Yes. So would someone like to make a motion on the pulmonology practice? I would move approval of uh, the provider transfer request for the pulmonology practice, which results in a negative point three impact on NPR. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the request, and I just want to say that uh, you know these three practices under the initial budget submission. I thought were highly questionable, and I thought that President Newman did a, a really good job of coming in and explaining why I was off base, and uh, I appreciated uh, her setting the record straight. So, is there other discussion? Is there any member of the public that wishes to say anything? Seeing none, all those in favor of, of approving the provider transfer practice request for pulmonology. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, and I, I just wanted to point out that um, their minus 2.2% triggers the 5% cap, which would essentially give them an allowable NPR growth rate of 2.8. And the approval of the pulmonology practice basically brings them into compliance. So I wanted to just point that out as we move forward. So next is dermatology. This is very similar um, to pulmonology in that it's representing the full scope of the practice. Um, so in 2018, the Green Mountain Care Board approved Central Vermont Medical Center to um, acquire dermatology Patients. This was not a, a case where the independent provider was now hospital employed. This was a case where the independent provider uh, providers ceased to operate, and so the hospital brought those patients on. At the time, it was a 0.4 FTE, so it was not the full scope of the practice. Now they are um, requesting to add another 0.8 FTE to alleviate the wait times that they're seeing. It's a 35-day wait time to see a dermatologist right now. So staff, we see this similar to the pulmonology practice, that this request is a follow-up to reflect the full scope of the volume from that initial transfer that was approved in 2018. The NPR impact is 731,000, 
and it affects NPR, it would effectively bring NPR down by 0.3%. And as you can see here, we recommend approving this. Okay, other questions from the board? Before we can make, can I just clarify that what the board is approving is the impact on the budget, not the actual transfer itself? Correct. Yeah, we, we don't have that authority. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? Would anyone like to make a motion? I move we approve CBMC's request to adjust their fiscal year budget to reflect the first of the volume associated with the previously approved for the LG acquisition, which results in a negative point three impact on NPR. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, is there any member of the public that wishes to say anything on this motion? Yeah. Would you ask whether the uh, whether any of these dermatologists have Mohs surgeons? So I think I, I need you to repeat it because I don't think I heard what you said. Could you ask, uh, could, do you know whether any of these dermatologists, the new dermatologists, are Mohs surgeons? Okay, John? No, they're not. There's uh, Mose is only done in the academic medical center. It's tertiary quaternary care service. Thank you. And there's a training program there too. Might as well get in some stump speed stuff. <laughs> Anyone else from the public? Just scratching in the back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then, moving on to alcohol. Oh, wait a second. No. You, have, oh, you actually have to oh, <laughs> Sorry. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, now I can. I just assumed you would, you, would, you would take our recommendation. Okay, oncology. So in this case, um, I'll just jump right to the recommendation is that we we don't feel that this one is eligible for the provider transfer adjustment. However, we do feel there is a strong case here for access to care. Um, specifically, their oncology practice justifies their um, NPR growth. So the details of this are that Central Vermont Medical Center is expanding their oncology coverage due to the increased need in the community for this service. Not just in the Central Vermont Medical Center area, but also um, to get Gifford and Copley patients. So it's a combination of Central Vermont sending docs to those other hospitals and also patients traveling from those areas to Central Vermont Medical Center. So this is clearly an access to care issue. Um, their impact on NPR is $2 million um, in FY22 million dollars. The current wait time for a new patient to see an oncologist is 19 days. And this expansion of the services is one FTE. Um, Two million is a lot. That would be a minus 0.9% impact on their NPR FPP. Just a reminder that now they are in compliance due to the tra transfers that you just um, approved. But again, we would say that this is not eligible for the provider transfer adjustment, just given the way that that mechanism works about bringing um, independent providers or, or patients into the into the hospital. But that we do think that this is a a very legitimate justification for their overall NPR growth. Okay, any questions from the board? Anyone? Is anyone prepared to make a motion? I move we deny the provider transfer request uh, for oncology in terms of its impact on NPR. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? I would just say um, you guys express you expressed it eloquently. You know what, why we wouldn't put it in there, and I think this is consistency for what we've done. You know when services increase, but certainly help support their request and their request because they're able to go up five percent from where they're currently trending. You know they, they don't need this to get there, which makes it a little bit easier in some ways. But I mean it, you know to be consistent, this is how we handle it these types of transactions. I just want to second that. I think it's a good investment and I'm happy to see them make the investment given the, the wait times and the obvious need for this in the community. So I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you eloquently said and what Maureen eloquently echoed. 
Yeah, I think it's really important that we say it. It's not that we're not supporting this investment. Right. It doesn't fall under the rules that we have for provider transfer. Right. Okay, any other discussion from the board? Now we'll open it up to public comment. Yeah. It may not be relevant, but I'm curious whether whether in the dealing with this that it backs out any services that either copy or give. I mean, in other words, it is, it's, it's obviously increasing uh, oncology care at for a larger area than just the hospital service area of Central Vermont. The, um, if, I, I just, but I don't know whether there's oncology services available now at either Gifford or and whether, if, in fact, you're getting the, that you're changing the mix over a larger region. Yeah, I think my understanding from the hearing was that CVMC is currently providing the oncology services at those two hospitals. So there are some services at the hospital, but with a CVMC or the medium network or something. Thank you. That was my understanding, at least from the hearing. Other comment from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Team. Excellent. Okay, this last page shows the accounting adjustment. So, um, first column is I would have a minus 0.4% impact on the NPR. This is reclassifying bad debt collection fees to expenses. The second request is the ACO counting, um, which would increase NPR by 0.8%, and this is reclassing payment reform investments to NPR deductions. And these two represent housekeeping adjustments. These are changes to their counting from FY19 to FY20, so when we incorporate this into their overall NPR request, again, you're seeing an apples to apples comparison of their actual growth. So in this case, um, the motion would be more of a recognition of this accounting adjustment as opposed to an approval of the accounting adjustment. Okay, are there questions from the board? Seeing none, would someone wish to make a motion? I move we recognize CVMC's accounting adjustments to reclassify bed debt collection fees as an expense and to reclassify payment reform investments as an NPR I'm sorry, reclassify payment reform investments as NPR deductions. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion from the board? I think this discussion on the concept of whether or not from an accounting adjustments we should be approving accounting adjustments, I mean, I think we need to recognize them. Um, but if that's what their accountants are telling them, and we, we want to make sure we're looking at an apples to apples, I, I would just put out there, you know, whether or not we officially need to approve these adjustments and, and, and that being then a precedent we'd be setting for the future. You know, last year we know they um, made some adjustments into where they were going to put some ACO fees and we just wanted to make sure we fully understood where they were and that we were looking at things if in one year it was in one place and the next year it was in another place that we could kind of manually make those adjustments in our mind to adjust the NPR. Um, but just the concept of approving accounting adjustments. Well, I think the language is actually recognized. Yeah. So I think the question is, do we need to even have a formal vote make sure we recognize? I don't know that you Right, but, but, but the language is specifically recognized, not yeah. approved, so. Yeah, and I think we already did vote on one of the accounting adjustments yeah. in yeah. an earlier hearing, so for consistency's sake, I would say we vote on it, but I, rec but I. Yeah, it's just something. Let's start that, that out for next year. Right. Recognize yeah. that we, Need May to I address whether we need to recognize that. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to bring it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything further from the board? Any comments from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? I just want to follow up to that, which is that we do in our year-to-date um, reporting ask the hospitals in the narrative section for updates and we would expect that something like this that's happening mid-year would be brought to our attention. So um, we'll look at the language of how we're asking that specifically to make it crystal clear that we would need to be notified about such accounting adjustments. Okay. 
going forward. This is Central Vermont's operating performance for fiscal year 19. And as we said, they are expecting to end the year at $206 million. And the budget is $218 million. Their operating margin has been pretty much in the negative or break even since the beginning of the uh, year. And this slide is showing you what is their history for their operating performance. And um, they have been um, pretty consistent through the uh, years. Um, we are showing in uh, 2014, 161 million. In 17, 195 million. And now for the projection, like we just mentioned, for 19 is 207 million. And the budget is 218 million for NPR. Their operating margin has um, dropped basically as of fiscal year 17, and they're trying to um, at least break even for 20. And we were not able to calculate the base cash on hand for the projection 19 or the budget 20 because of these new numbers. But their agent of plant is growing, so they're going to be needing some cash. What was the difficulty in calculating that? We don't have the full budget. We didn't have a balance sheet, and we just had uh, new P&L information. And I'm pretty sure that they committed to working with staff to uh, fill in the, uh, right. the blanks. So it will be estimated. <laughs> Their change in charge for South Vermont is 3% overall change in charge and a 5.9% for commercial. We, again, because of the change, these budget change, we don't have what the NPR change in charge is, comparison, and the value of 1% change in charge. This cost, um, but their change request from 19 budget to 20 is 6,656,226. This hospital has had an average approved um, change in charge of 3.2% for the last five years. And this is their ACO information. As we, we've been kind of cruising through these slides in the past, in the other hearings. And Porter Medical Center. Well, we're going to take them one at a time, so hopefully you have a staff recommendation. Those will be coming up. Yeah. So we have a slide that has the table matrix of, of deliberation that we're going to get to. Um, but we first want to, you hadn't even seen those slides yet for Central Vermont Medical Center. They were omitted from last Wednesday's presentation. So um, if you'd like, you can discuss or wait until we get to the recommendation portion. I just assume focus on one at a time. I don't okay. know how other board members do it. Okay. So should we put up the recommendation slide? Yes, please. Okay. okay, Central Vermont Medical Center. <clears throat> so with the um, two approvals this morning, they are uh, now within compliance on MPR and uh, under that 5% cap. Um, this is a hospital, as you know, that is going through some financial stresses. Um, <clears throat> and even though they're facing their third consecutive year of negative margins, the projected year-end figure um, does re represent an improvement of almost 50% over fiscal year-end prior year. <clears throat> the updated fiscal year budget uh, we consider to be much more reasonable than the initial budget that was presented. And um, it is certainly attainable if things continue the way they're going there, even though they're losing nearly $4 million at the end of this year, as projected, that is a significant uh, uh, improvement over prior year end. So there is hope that this will continue. Um, uh, that said, the key factors to the 19 improvement are expected to continue. Um, with uh, Consolidation and cost savings measures that they cited in their presentation. Um, the hospital is requesting the 5%, 5.9% change in charge to aid with, aid with margin recovery, which we hope to see. Um, the request is higher than their five-year average um, of 3.2%, which has historically placed them in the bottom median of all the hospitals, kind of on the threshold of being in that lower uh, quartile. 
That said, we do want to note, because we pressed on this in our initial presentations, that um, watching a hospital under financial duress as they are and on the doorstep of an EMR implementation, we just want to make it noted that that is a concern of ours. Um, that said, we understand that CBMC and UVM Health Network leadership are probably going to be monitoring this hospital's uh, rollout of that implementation very closely. But we want to keep it on, on everyone's mind that those types of implementations have shown in the past with other hospitals that there are revenue cycle issues that need to be ironed out, um, as well as other data migration factors that go into EMR implementation. So that's something we want to point out because, as you can see, um, we have added um, an additional recommendation there that if uh, those types of factors begin to impact CBMC's financial recovery, that we would like to have those conversations with. CBMC and health network staff should those occur. Um, overall, we do um, recommend that you approve the NPR as submitted, the change in charge as submitted, and um, with the ongoing caveat that there should be bi-monthly monitoring to remain consistent with other hospitals under financial duress. The only comment I would make is that I do think that um, Another point that was in the letter of laws is the burden on some of these uh, requests, especially for bi-monthly meetings and things like this. And this is a, a hospital that, that is part of the network. Um, it's not one that I'm worried about them closing the doors on immediately. So I, I really wonder if it, it's necessary to do it bi-monthly. I, I would hope we could extend that out to at least a quarter of the yeah. um, I'm just going to say I support the NPR request as revised. I think it's removed some of the aspiration. Uh, I think it's much more realistic. I also support the uh, charge request, although it's high, uh, at 5.9. If you look historically, the last three years, it's been 2.5, 0.7, 2.3. That's not kept pace with medical inflation. So in some sense, it's the catch up that they need to get to their bottom line. Um, one of the things, though, in consistency with the other hospitals, uh, I'll note that they've reduced their NPR, but they didn't reduce their expenses. And so I think the spirit and the intent should be also added to there that we hope that to the extent that they can reduce the variable costs that would have been associated with that volume that's now no longer in their budget that those expenses would come down. Um, and I would also like to add this hospital to the list of hospitals that I would like to see some sort of sustainability plan from. And I have some thoughts about what, I think at the end of our budget conversation, um, I, I wanted to share some thoughts. I know that, that we got in the letter from Voss was sort of, can you put some more framework around what a sustainability plan is? So I have some thoughts, I think that we can have a little conversation about that, and obviously incorporate the hospitals in that conversation and see what sustainability plan might look like. So, but this would be another hospital, given their declining operating margin, the financial health concern, I would add this to the list. Well, I think time-wise we're doing pretty darn well, so I think we will have ample opportunity to take that up during new business. Um, so th this is definitely a hospital that's struggling. Um, if not for the backing and support of the network, there would definitely be more concern. Um, I think we should have them in for bi-monthly monitoring. And the reason why is if we look at the past, you know, the, their expense controls have not been managed well, um, or there's just a lot going on. If we look at the past two years, their NPR forecast for 2018 was 198. They came in at 195. Their expenses were forecasted to be at 208. They came in at 216. Went from a what was to be a $4 million operating gain to an $8 million operating loss. When we look at 2019, and I don't have all of the updated numbers, I can kind of adjust. Their budget was uh, 2000, uh, 211 million. They're coming in at 207 million. Their expenses were to be 221 million, making $3 million. Their expenses are now 225, 226 million, losing $4 million. Um, and now for 2020, 
then you've brought down their numbers from what the original submission was to 222 to 218, which I think is prudent to do that. But as Jess said, they've kept their expenses at 234 million and making a break even. And the confidence that they will actually come in at only 234 million, and that there'll be a break even based on the past two year trends of swings of 10 million and $9 million on the bottom line. Um, I think you know we've kind of been setting the precedent that we're having these hospitals come back in every couple months to go through that. And I understand that they're supported by the network, but it hasn't yet been showing that they're able to manage their expenses to their um, income levels and the changes have been significant. And if, if this were not a hospital that had the backing of the network, we probably would very well be saying this could be one that would be facing much more uh, challenges with their bank covenants, with their um, sustainability. I mean, it's not sustainable to to run that way. Maybe you know, in, in the future, if we did look at this as a total network and there were some changes, you know, that would help that. But I would be uncomfortable almost giving them a pass of not coming back every two months because they're supported by the network, because I don't think that they've been managed well from the expense base to their revenue. And without seeing a different plan as to that's what we want to do, we're trying to run this, you know, at a loss each year and we're getting these significant strengths. And we had surprises in this process, right? We, we got a budget and then that budget changed. We got a forecast and that forecast changed. So it seems that their controls need to be in better place here and with the fact that they're switching to it, you know, being impacted with Epic and some of that that could additionally create some changes. You know, I don't look at it necessarily as administrative burden if in fact they actually need to have additional oversight and review in order to get them to be managing more compliantly because we don't want to end up with a surprise you know, <laughs> later on as well. So I just look at, you know, adding these things is not necessarily an administrative burden. If people were hitting their forecasts and coming in where they were planning to be, we wouldn't have this. But they've, this is a hospital that has had significant, probably some of the most significant swings with losses of eight million and four million. We don't even know if the four million loss is, is realistically where they're gonna end up for 2019. And to come in with a break even for next year on 218 million of top line, um, that, that's not a sustainable long-term plan. So. Um, I support, although the commercial charge is, is high, I think that they need it to get back on track. I support the NPR. You know, I would just say I do think um, having them come in two months versus three months, you know, it's, a, it's additional two times a year versus quarterly. Um, I think it's warranted. I um, couldn't have said it any better. I certainly couldn't have said it any better that it is just kind of glaring uh, in a way to see uh, the revenue drop from 222, the NPR drop from 222 down to 218, but the cost of uh, 234 million on the expense side um, untouched. And um, I think that uh, you know, beyond just being consistent across all hospitals, uh, there is an expense issue here. The, um, you know, the level of uh, uh, operating expense in 2018 actual was 216 million, and now we're jumping to 234 million, and, and that has yet to be part of the discussion in terms of all of these adjustments on the NPR side. So uh, I would support having the committee. So I would just say that uh, we require monthly reporting, and staff analyzes that monthly reporting. We all see that. There's nothing that would ever prohibit us from calling somebody in quicker for a discussion. Um, in this particular case, Ann and Steve were five minutes down the road, so it's probably not a big deal. Um, but I do have empathy, and it's empathy for all hospitals. I, I just don't want to waste anyone's time. And, you know, that's the bottom line for me. I don't know whether bi-monthly or quarterly makes 
which one makes more sense, but I do think it probably doesn't make sense to have different increments, so quarterly, bi-monthly meetings, but quarterly reports. I would, whatever we decide on the increment, I, I would have, I would have it, if you're gonna do a meeting, you might as well just do a meeting with all the topics and not require necessarily a separate written report that could be handled in the meeting, because quite frankly, that seems like, a, to me, that's what seems like especially burdensome is having multiple requirements that basically means they're doing something different over different increments. I think to that, they really report monthly. All the hospitals yeah. report monthly, but they don't really update their forecast monthly. Um, so, you know, monthly is typically looking at their actuals um, and not a, a full refresh. So. I was thinking more of the quarterly cost savings report. Like, wouldn't it make more sense if we're doing whatever we're doing in terms of monitoring that that's and the EPIC implementation be rolled all together? Because presumably when you're talking with them, you would talk with them about what's going on with cost savings as well. Yep, get it all done at once. Um, the, the other thing I would say is I also support the commercial charge because while I agree it's it's high and I had said earlier in this process that 4% is kind of where I was comfortable given the financial concerns and the historic growth rate I'm comfortable in this instance with the 5.9 and also with the NPR which is just but I don't, I don't feel like I know where where we're gonna land on the monitoring, so maybe we can have a little more. Well, I haven't waited on that as well, and I'm actually with Kevin, in the sense that we get reports every month from them. Um, I recognize that we also, we do need to be on top of those reports and ensuring that the information that we're receiving, um, if there are triggers, if there are red flags, that we pick up the phone and call and have those conversations, but, so I would be in the camp of, we get the monthly reports, I think, uh, you know, quarterly. Be fine. But I, I'm concerned about administrative burden. And I've read that letter from Boston. I think there's some merits to the administrative burden we're posting, imposing on hospitals. They have a lot of work to do. And uh, we need to be monitoring them, but we can do that in a monthly reporting and follow them. Yeah, my concern is that some of these hospitals are not as closely monitoring their expenses and NPR each month. And, and, and so when they they just get their system report, they look through it, they're not necessarily doing a new forecast because a lot of these surprises have happened, you know, at the end of the year, all of a sudden they're reconciling things. So I'm concerned that a lot of these hospitals are not on top of looking at where their expenses are trending and they're not as focused on that during the course of the year. And then they have these big changes and the reports that they give us monthly do not go through that level of detail on the forecast of where they're going to end up in expenses. So, is, so one, is one solution then to change, uh, address that in the monthly report and add a forecast one? So have we done any updates to your forecast and asking them to do that? Because in a sense that's what you'd be doing in a meeting is asking them what the forecast update is. So if we actually just put that in the monthly report, we could be keeping tabs on it and ensuring that they're actually doing it. There's fewer surprises. We get the data that we need, and then we reach out to those hospitals whose forecasts are starting to change. Would that be a solution? So the, F, the forecast is part of the submission, um, but I think the concern is that the hospital may not be putting the methodology behind their forecast when they're reporting month after month after month. Maybe that's more of your concern, Morgan. And most we do change. request the we do require the information that is submitted to no. us. And you start to see it in your monthly reports. No, I guess what I'm saying is that if, if, it, they're not, if they're not changing, it means they're not actually changing their methodology right. or truly up. Right. So I guess right. what I'm saying is, could we change the language that we use and what we're asking them to submit so that we ensure that they are making those adjustment mm -hmm. updates on a more regular basis? Mm -hmm. Well, it gets back to the comment that Dale made earlier, <laughs> is one month a trend. And I think that's the huge that's part fair. of that problem. And I, I agree. But I, I would just say, I mean, I can support going to the quarter, but I just want to be out there saying this is a hospital that probably has one of the worst performances on bottom line. And to give them a different pass versus the other hospitals that, have, that we told bi-monthly to, you know, I don't buy that because they're supported by the network 
that that's okay to do that because that hasn't shown in their financial performance and corrections have not happened. And that's why you know, I was trying to be consistent with where we've gone with other hospitals who are in similar situations. And this is, for the last two years, I think we could look at it and say is the worst. There's swings from a three, 3 million positive to a 7 million negative, a 3 million positive forecast to a 4 million negative um, is pretty significant. Okay, consistency is a good argument. <laughs> consistency with other hospitals. Yeah, I think I, I'm there too. I'm at the buy something. Um, you want to make a motion? Uh, before I make a motion, could I have three minutes to consult the staff on the appropriate NPR percentage? So I'm going to declare a recess till 10:30. Give everybody a bio break, and then we'll be able to charge until we can watch. Details 
for each of those guesses in the following slides. It's worth noting here that the combined effect of all of these, they offset each other, so essentially their 3.5 request is, is not affected. If all of these were approved, they would still be at 3.5%. So just kind of pointing that out for you. Does the board wish to treat these as uh, separate motions or combined motions? <laughs> I would combine them. Oh, are you okay with them? Yep. Great, so the general surgery, and you did see these last Wednesday. Um, the only thing that we updated to this, the financial information that we had on the screen was, we, we spoke with Jen and, and sorted it out. It was not the correct financial information. Um, so now this is the correct financial information. So. For general surgery, it's a 361,000 impact on their NPR. Um, we do feel that this is this is an eligible um, candidate for the provider transfer acquisition mechanism. Um, there were two independent general surgeons that unexpectedly left the community, and Porter supporting the need by bringing on. They brought one of them on board. Um, the future retirement of the second independent general surgeon, Porter will be employing him in the interim to ensure continuity of care. So this represents a 0.75% FTE increase, and the impact on their NPR is minus 0.4%. <coughs> and we recommend approving. Did the board want to vote on this, or, or do that? No, we made a decision to do them all as well. Okay. <laughs> Next is radiology. Um, so again, as you heard last week, Porter has had a long-standing relationship with Middlebury radiologists. They've provided interpretation of imaging. But with the transfer of this independent practice, Porter is able to offer a fully integrated service line as of June 2019. This integration will streamline the patient experience with regard to the billing process. So Porter is bringing them on board. They brought them on board effective June 1st. It's an FTE equivalent of 1.8 um, FTEs, and the impact on NPR essentially would bring it down by 0.9%. And again, we feel that this is a, um, eligible for the provider transfer acquisition mechanism and we would recommend approving it. So those are the two provider transfers. The next slide is the accounting adjustment. Um, so Porter proposes an accounting adjustment. This is very similar to what you just saw with Central Vermont Medical Center. However, their adjustment is just for the ACO accounting, which would, um, it's for ACO payment reform investments, reclassifying them as NPR. So we would see essentially an increase in their NPR by 1.2. And this is again, you'll, you'll get tired of me saying this, but this is to ensure that the board is looking at apples to apples, actual growth rate from 19 to 20. And so we would recommend recognizing this accounting adjustment. So, Laura, are you prepared to make a motion? I am. I move we approve Porter Medical Center's two requests to adjust their fiscal year 20 budget to reflect provider acquisitions, radiology and general surgery, and that we recognize the accounting adjustment. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there further board discussion on this? Seeing none, is there any discussion from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Excellent. So, again, the combined effect of those still leaves quarter at 3.5. Um, this is just an update to the charts to reflect their. Um, resubmitted information on their projections. So their projection now reflects the new number for NPR and also for operating margin, bringing them to a 4.5% operating margin for the end of the year. And then this chart has been updated again to reflect the update in their projection. We saw this last week, so no need to go into the detail, but Porter's change in charge. They're asking for a 0% overall change in charge, 2.6% percent commercial change in charge and their five-year blended average of their commercial and their overall is a 4.3 percent approved average.
questions from the board? Is there a motion? I'm happy to make a motion, but I don't know if staff wants to go over their recommendations first. Thank you, Robin. Yes, you would. <laughs> So with the approved uh, provider transfers and accounting changes, as you've heard, Porter is within budget. Their commercial charge request of 2.6% we consider appropriate as it is well under their five-year historical average of 4.3%. Uh, this is a hospital that is a success story in rural health care, um, having come back from some significant financial struggles several years ago. Um, they are operating um, very uh, stable and Things are improving there, um, and we support the NPR growth as well as the change in charge to continue that growth um, on the bottom line and um, build cash reserves to make necessary improvements to their facility. I do have one question. Um, the Medicare Advantage Plan that was are you staff thinking that's just generally that we put in the order that should there be any impact that they let us notify us? Correct. Should there be any impact, we'd want to be notified of it. Or if we begin to see um, struggles at a hospital that's performing well, like Porter, we would want to reach out and make sure things are going well with the implementation. Or if not, um, give us a little background on what's happening. I'm ready to move, make a motion to approve Porter's budget with an NPR of 3.5% and 0% overall change in charge, which, and a 2.6% commercial change in charge. Uh, and also that the order include a requirement that they notify the board of any impacts uh, from the EPIC implementation and their operating performance. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion on the floor? Oh. I just want to make the note that um, I think two or three times during the hearing, uh, the board of folks came in talking about and uh, the, the need for capital improvements uh, at, at this site and uh, having tour facility recently. Um, I could agree. And um, I'm just happy to see this. Uh, Turn and fortunes at border and thinking about their ability to fund those capital investments and noting that of the 529 million that the board has approved in, in certificate of, certificates of need since uh, uh, 2014, uh, border hasn't uh, been to that table yet. And so my guess is if things continue the way they are, we will not be seeing the same like the better. And I would just add, I want to. Um, compliment this hospital on meeting their forecasts for expenses um, and top line for the past couple of years. So last year they slightly beat their NPR going from 78 million to 80.3 million for 2018. And they kept their expenses at 81.1 budget to 81.2. This year their expenses were forecast to be 86.2. They're coming in about 86.4 with an increase in NPR and quite a significant improvement in their operating margin, I think partially due to this adjustment they're getting back, you know, and, and all of a sudden we've had a big change. So um, I think this is a hospital that's showing, you know, for a critical access hospital that they're able to um, meet their forecasts and we're not seeing big swings when they change the top line. <coughs> I can support the 2.6% commercial charge, but I would hope in the future for this hospital, since they're gaining a lot of synergies from being part of the network, you know, that we really look at a 0% potentially one year or even lower. And I know you have been bringing your numbers down, and I know there's an impact of inflation and things like that, but you're more than offsetting those impacts with the synergies that you have been getting from the network. And I know in 2020, you're actually carrying a bunch of one-time costs for the EPIC system and things like that that should go away in 21. So just, you know, I think you're managing your P&L well, and um, it's just we don't have that many opportunities where maybe costs don't get passed on to consumers, and this is a hospital in the future, and I think maybe if you were looking at a network that some of those adjustments could be in, but, you know, I can 
I can support where you are right now, and you know, I appreciate it as a hospital that you're meeting your your expenses and you're maintaining and monitoring them really closely. Anything else from the board? Would any member of the public wish to make a comment? John? I would just comment that uh, irrespective of the size or being in a system, if you're looking at the individual components and not at the sum of the whole, to not have uh, 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 growth in a uh, charge that uh, is at medical inflation has negative compounding ramifications that dig real deep holes really quickly. I would just point out that Porter's essentially been at, to do a four-year average, um, they're uh, uh, right at medical inflation. So again, individually, I think we certainly would pay attention to that. Um, if the board was able through <coughs> legislation to look at the whole, you could look at inflation. But I go back again to 2012 when I made the pledge that with that increase in charge of that year, that we could run this network at uh, the rate uh, of medical inflation. And we've had somewhat of a, uh, a hold up because of uh, not being at that. And that's key to also the pledge that I made to not pass the cost of the Miller building or Epic on to the consumers, um, that obviously would have required uh, charges on average that are much greater than uh, the cost of inflation. So that, just letting you know how uh, I've thought of this in the uh, financial management team and uh, our network has thought about it. Other comments from the public? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We're making great time, team. Thank you, board. And with our final deliberation of the day, we have the University of Vermont Medical Center. <coughs> uh, their request is 6.1% over their 19 budget, 4.1% over their projection. Um, projected NPR is 1.9% over budget year to date. The 19 operating margin projection would represent the fourth consecutive year of margin decline. Um, and looking at this, we have a little bit of concern um, with that type of precipitous decline because from fiscal year end 2015, should this projection come to fruition, that would mark a 48% reduction in their operating margin. Um, with a hospital that is coming up to the plate to make investments in this in healthcare in the state where needed, the psychiatric center, the Miller building, um, epic efficiencies, et cetera. Uh, those margins need to be rebuilt. Um, cash reserves need to be replenished. There was also discussion around the um, potential for a uh, reduction in their bond rating, which would impact <coughs> uh, cost of care because that is eventually going to be passed on someplace else we would anticipate. Um, so with that said, um, we would um, recommend that the commercial charge of 4% be retained um, and a combination of options here with NPR, um, the 6.1% could be um, approved as submitted or reduced slightly to reflect 2019 operating performance. That said, that would be around 4.1%. Um, so we feel the happy zone would probably be in the middle of 5.1%. So if you bring that down 1% to 5.1%, that would be the equivalent of about $12.7 million in NPR. Um, additional recommendations we have are to review that change in charge, come enforcement time, and as with the other hospitals in the network, um, report on any epic implementation impacts that may occur. Questions from the board? <coughs> I just want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what their history has been as far as, or if we're looking at 19, you know, the significant change from their budget projections. So, you know, this is a hospital that has their top line increases, their expenses increase more than their top line. So in 2018, 
they had net patient revenue budget of 1209 and went to 1254, um, but their expenses went from 1265 to the billion to 265 to a billion 317. So they uh, went down in operating income with a significant increase in the top line. In 2019, we're running the same uh, same way, going from 1273 for NPR to 1297, and we factor in other revenue going from 1.38 to 1432, and expenses going up again significantly more, 1339 to 1393, um, maintaining the operating margin with a top line increase of um, over 50 million. So it, it's just challenging to see with these increases how, in fact, you know, the, the expenses are continuing to extend higher than what the increase they're getting. And part of the reason, one of the reasons they brought up in the meetings were when they beat the top line, then we need higher temps and locums and things like that. But I think in 2019, um, it was an under forecast to begin with. And now that they're exceeding it, nothing's dropping to the bottom line. So I, I don't know what to do with that. I'm just saying I understand what you're saying, and there are significant incremental costs this year um, for Miller and for Epic. Uh, not saying that they're increasing rate by that, um, but depreciation is going up significantly year over year for the Miller building. There's a lot of one-time costs for Epic. So the expectation was that the margin would go down a little bit during these first couple of years as that was coming on and there were duplicative costs. Um, so just challenged with that, and just want to put out that you know this is another one we just need to see how, why their expenses are going up that high, you know whether or not the full four percent is warranted or not um, when there's such a increase on NPR year over year in 2019 in their budget. I mean it's two percent up, and so you know it will be something we could be addressing in enforcement down the road, but just wanted to put that up. Other discussion? No. Uh, this, this one is difficult for me because uh, the medical center is such a big fish in the sea here. And, um, you know, kind of, kind of looking at it at a macro scale, there's some things that, that do strike, strike me. Um, one is, there's like four or five things that strike me. One is that the medical center is, uh, since 2014, has been the fourth highest uh, growth rate in NPR at 4.2 percent, um, and given their size, that's significant to the, in the, to the overall system. And uh, in terms of the network, uh, Central Vermont and Porter are neighbors in that regard. Um, uh, you know, the top one, as I've said before, is Northeastern. So we have a hospital and a network of hospitals growing um, at a rate that exceeds our um, Kind of working number of 3.5%. Um, the uh, in 2019, um, uh, the budget was missed by um, about $24 million. Uh, it was a $19 million increase of proof, which, as I recall, was the request of, of, of the university, um, and that was exceeded by $24 million. Um, and I, you know, I understand Maureen's logic uh, in regard to where that takes that takes us, and I'll, and I'll get there in a minute. Um, the operating margins at the medical center have been very favorable for the last five years at between 3.4% and 6.3%, with an average of 5.1% since 2014. And in dollars, what that means is that of the $393 million in operating margin across all 14 hospitals, $316 million of it um, has gone to the bottom line um, at, the, at, the, at the medical center. Um, and then for 2019, it's projected that um, about 35 million in system-wide operating margin and UVM is, is uh, projecting to uh, consume 39.4 of that. And that is possible because there are seven hospitals um, in 2019 projecting negative uh, operating margins. In terms of uh, certificates of need, um, looking at the history there since 2014, uh, the, the medical center uh, has been a 
approved for $285 million in uh, certificates of need out of a total of $529 million. Um, and that's a 73 percent uh, rate. And I, I don't, I'm not saying this in a critical sense, I, but I'm saying that there's something in the system that doesn't seem to me to be allocating the scarce care under a three and a half percent cap uh, to hospitals equally. And so we have some that may be dying on the line and others that are doing quite well. And I think uh, some of that falls to the issue of the payer mix, uh, and Union Medical Center has a very favorable payer mix, and some of it falls to cost shift because uh, the Union Medical Center, I think, has like 11 percent on Medicaid um, uh, clientele, and so as Medicaid underpays, they have the commercial side of, of their revenue stream uh, to, to solve that problem. Um, so I kind of think, okay, where would we be if after re-benchmarking uh, UVM Medical Center in 2018, and that was a $39 million dollar benchmarking um, off of 2017. Um, where would we be if we uh, gave UVM Medical Center the max uh, in terms of our guidelines, which would be um, a 3.2% in uh, 2019 and a 3.5% for 2020 um, off the base of a million two hundred and fifty two a billion, excuse me, billion two hundred and fifty two million dollars. And that would take us to a billion three hundred and thirty one million. Um, and this request is uh, twenty million dollars over that. Um, and if that were taken off the top, it would still be a thirty three million dollar um, increase of, for UVN. So I don't quite I mean that uh, or Marines I don't quite know what to do with this and, and I'm I'm not faulting the medical center, but I think that there are some um, um, inequities in the distribution system, mostly having to do with payer mix and having to do with the cost shift, and that if not only being a force um, uh, in the medical infrastructure in Vermont, but a force in terms of finding a way with laws and with the legislature to um, um, you know, fix this. Um, for example, in rate review, we have um, this risk adjustment system where uh, you can see um, where money flow from MVP to uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield based on some acuity issues to kind of balance out the system. And I don't see that here in Vermont. Uh, um, you Medicaid basically sets a rate for everybody. And if you happen to have a high commercial mix, you can cover that if you don't. Uh, Look at Springfield, you can end up like Springfield. So I, I, I don't know where to go with that. My, 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 my basic uh, number is, is the billion three hundred and thirty one million, which is taking the rebased amount off 2018, multiplying it by the top end of our, mm -hmm. our, our, our guidelines for 2019 uh, and 2020, and that's the number. And it's a billion three hundred and thirty one million versus the request of a billion uh, Other comments from the board? Sure. Um, so this one was a tough one, obviously, um, for a whole host of reasons, the size of the institution and the degree to which it's over the guidance. Um, I hear what you're saying, Tom, it's tough, but I think I look at things some of what's happening here, I think we have to look at some of the facts. There's a definite population shift. So some of what you're seeing moving through the system is people literally moving through the system, and moving to Chittenden County from other areas. There are more people seeking care up at UVM um, from other areas even if they haven't moved their residences. Uh, some of that may be a function of the aging of the population and that the academic medical center is where the specialty care is largely delivered, so referrals are going up there. And I think we saw data on unique patients that was compelling, whether you know it wasn't part of our the way we thought about our budget guidance, but the data is there that more people are going to the the UVM Medical Center. Um, I don't think that we want UVM to turn away patients. I don't think they will, and I think the patients are coming. Uh, I think if we break it down, fiscal year 19, they were three and a half percent over fiscal year 18 actuals. Um, so it was about 3.3% greater than what our maximum guidance would have been. <laughs> they, their budget was less than that because they came in at, I think it was 1.1. They were allowed 3.2. They came in a little over what our guidance would have been had they 
um, for 3.2, but they didn't. They had a conservative budget. Uh, growth from fiscal year 19 projected to fiscal year 20 budget is 4.1 percent, a little bit high over our budget guidance. But again, if you think about where they're projected to where they're going, it's not that far off what our guidance actually is. So I think the question is, do we think that the growth in patient volume could account for that extra percentage? And for me, I do think it's true that that's it's justified by the evidence. Some of the other hospitals did not provide compelling evidence that there was actually real volume changes. To me, UVM did. Um, we offer guidance. But we always ask each hospital to provide their unique circumstances. And I think the volume here was justified. People are aging, they're moving from all parts of the state, and they're voting with their feet, and they're going to the academic medical center, and that's real. We've heard in the hearings that they're in surge. We heard from Northeastern that they couldn't get placement at UVM Medical Center because there were no beds available there. Um, and therefore, people are going into and sending their patients to Boston and other places. And we consistently hear about long waits. So the volume is there. We can't put our heads in the sand until the volume doesn't exist. Uh, their commercial rate request is 4%. Again, as I've been trying to be consistent with every hospital, that's in line with medical inflation. In fiscal year 17, we gave them 2.5%. In 18, we gave them 0.7%. And last year, we gave them 2.5%. All of those were below medical inflation. So to me, this is a, those are unsustainable. This is a bit of a catch-up, and they're asking for medical inflation. If we're wondering to some degree why their operating margin is falling, um, and we're wondering why their expenses are growing faster than uh, their revenue, part of that has to do with their expense growth is happening at medical inflation. Revenue is weak captive. So Medicare and Medicaid don't keep up with medical inflation, and we kept them below medical inflation on the commercial rate. So it's not surprising to some degree that their operating margins are shrinking how the system works. So to me, um, their operating margin this year is, is decent, but it's relatively low when you think about the academic medical centers in general. It's in the 25th percentile. So that's a relatively low operating margin um, compared to other like hospitals. And the fact that it's shrinking is worrying me. So to the degree that their operating margin is one of the um, factors that affects bond ratings, we know they have some investments on the forefront that only the academic medical center can do. There was no other hospital that was stepping in and saying, hey, we're going to add inpatient mental health capacity. The academic medical center is the one that, through some intervention to some degree by the Green Mountain Care Board, but is doing it. And they're going to require more than what was set aside in their, um, in their overage from a few years ago to do that. So I'm worried about reducing their operating margin. I don't want to compromise their ability to hire staff um, during this workforce shortage. I don't want to compromise their ability to get the lowest possible borrowing rates. And the other thing is, I think we have to recognize that UVM Medical Center is the backstop for these other two small hospitals. Porter's doing really well. That's fantastic. Epic is about to come online. I've been through that hospital and Epic, or not Epic, but the previous EMR came online. There were productivity losses. I know they've been factored into the budget. Um, but we don't know how that implementation is going to go at CPMC. We don't quite know how that's going to go. Who's going to backstop that? UVM is going to be backstop of that. Um, to the extent that UVM is the backstop in the all care model when there are problems with risk reserves, that's going to be the backstop there. So to the extent that we're asking this hospital to make a lot of investments that no other hospital can make, and we're asking this hospital to be the backstop for a lot of the payment reform that we're doing, and their operating margins are declining, and the rate request is in line with medical inflation, in fact, is catching up to the over, perhaps, uh, adjustments we may have made in the past. I'm comfortable with this budget to the extent that I think this is what the hospital needs to deliver the care that we want for our Vermonters. I think affordability is really important. Don't get me wrong. Approving this budget is hard to swallow because we have to consider affordability and this makes it harder. But we also have to consider quality and access. And in addition to that, much of this is volume driven and that means it's access and quality driven. And so more patients are voting with their feet, they're seeking the care at the, at the medical center. In my mind, this is a budget that we need to approve and we need to figure out a way to get more hospitals and more patients in the all-payer model so that we can start shifting 
and changing some of the costs, but these costs are real because they're coming from bonds. That's, those are my thoughts. Yeah, just, just want to add one perspective too on the top line as far as um, just correlating some of the change to some of the commercial increase as well. I mean, from where their projection is, I think their 2019 forecast, um, their budget was uh, too low to begin with. I expressed that last year, and I think they should have been at the 3.2%, and they came in at you know, around 1%. So I think where they're coming in this year is about you know, what, would have been, what would the expectation would have been this year to compared to their forecast, they're up 4.1%. Um, and that additional increase, if you will, that 0.6% is about $7.7 .7 million. Um, just throwing out as comparison, not saying we should take it there, but the commercial increase uh, rate is adding about $20 million to the top line. So you know, that is certainly a contributing factor into what's driving them over the guidance that we have put forward. Um, I appreciate the comments I just put out there. I do believe, though, to where they said they were going to be with Epic and Miller, that they are about where they were supposed to be for their operating margins. Their operating margins were supposed to come down. You know, we've seen a $13 million increase, as I said, in um, depreciation going from 53 to 65, from 19 to 20, which is really driven by, by the Epic, I mean, by Miller. Uh, Epic has a lot of duplicative costs this year and inefficiencies running two systems, so it's not a surprise that we would be lower this year and getting back up there in the future. But you know, part of what is driving this over is the commercial ask as a variable. And you know, one option is if we went to three and a half percent or something, that's you know, three million dollars that would be consistent with what we did with um, uh, North Eastern as well, um, and that would be consistent with medical inflation for the year. Some of the adjustments for the prior years have been relative to their their overperformance year over year on the top line. So, you know, there has there whether we'll be consistent or not in saying you know if hospitals over deliver that there will be some type of enforcement or not. You know, but that is part of what's driving us it over. Is 4.1 percent unreasonable year over year? Do we expect that to happen? Yeah, I think that's probably what you're going to see for the year. Um, and again, a portion of that 20 plus million is related just to charge. Do you have any comments from the board? I'm still thinking. <laughs> I'm reflecting on everyone's comments. I think I'll just add, Maureen, I hear you on the three and a half that would be consistent with Northeastern, but I think to be consistent, it would be consistent if the charges uh, were consistent over the five-year period. So Northeastern had relatively at in medical inflation charging cases over a five-year average. The medical center has not. And so it would be, in some sense, inconsistent to do the same thing. But the medical center is also, you know, they need to own what their forecasts have been. And I interpreted that part of the reason they're not making more on the bottom line in 2019 is because they needed to hire temps and local, more temps, locals, and things like that because they didn't have the right top line forecast in there, and then you're catching up because you know one option is you have the right forecast in, you have the right staffing. If you don't, you know then they're saying we're getting higher expenses rather than getting some of the synergies over fixed costs. So. If, you know, part of what I'm saying is they're 2% over for 2019. And do we just let that slide and say, you know, they're coming in a lot higher, they're not gaining anything for it on the bottom line. But. Any other comment from the board? If not, is anyone prepared to make a motion? Well, I'll make a motion. I'm glad you said anyone. <laughs> um, well, I'll make a motion. Let's see how it goes. But I will make a motion that we accept the budget as submitted um, in the 6.1% NPR and a 4% commercial charge, and that uh, we were asked for any uh, epic implementation impacts 
should they affect their operating performance to be reported to the board? Is there a second? Seeing none, that motion will fail. Does anybody else wish to make an attempt at a motion? I'm happy to, but I just need another minute to think. <laughs> Sorry like for. A, would you like a five minute recess? Yes, that would actually probably be better than everybody sitting here quietly while yeah. I think. <laughs> we'll resume again at 11 15. Thank you. You're going to resume? So. Um, Obviously, I have been, since I asked for a recess, struggling with what to do in this particular case. Um, and uh, I, I kind of agree with all the pros and cons that people have thrown out there in terms of the different considerations, which is partially what makes it challenging. Um, for me, I do think that it's important to recognize that the 2019 budget had, at least for me, if you didn't come in asking for 3.2, I would have gone with the guidance amount. So to recognize that basically the forecast in 2019 was off um, and the actuals are coming in uh, a little bit over the guidance of what would have been the guidance had we approved it. Um, so that's a factor that's important to me. Um, and, and so I'm going to throw another idea out there, um, and I'll do it in a motion so that if people don't like it, we can vote it down and move on. Um, but what I would, I would move that we approve UVM Medical Center's budget with uh, a 5.5% increase, which to me reflects a 3.5% increase over the forecast. So if we use the forecast to the projected 19 projected to 20 and do the guidance amount of 3.5 and consulting with staff, I think that's a 5.5% NPR and approve uh, a 3% overall change in charge and a 4% commercial charge um, with um, I don't think we actually need in the motion that we would review the change in charge and enforcement. I think we would do that anyway. Um, but I would indicate that UVM should notify us if the FAA application has impact on the pay to a lot of the effect forecast. It's kind of a complicated motion because I included my explanation, but the summary is 5.5% NPR, 4%. I will second it. Okay, is there discussion on the motion? Um, yes. I don't, I understand what you're doing and that, that puts it at, um, you know, the three and a half percent year over year. Um, but I don't see how they're gonna get there. Uh, they've come in saying, you know, that they want a 4.1. Um, if, if we did it by commercial change, I could see a way a path to get there. Um, just saying, you know, that the the five that number, the five and a half, which gets us down to the three and a half, may make us feel good that we have them at a three and a half percent NPR. But I would imagine that we would be here next year and they would be exceeding that number by half percent, one percent, two percent, and. You know, so I'm not sure what we've really done with that. Would just be my comment there. If if um, if we're going to accept the charge as is at four percent, then I would accept the six point one. Um, if we were going to make a motion where we reduce the charge to three or three and a half, then I would say we would reduce the NPR. And I'm not saying you know what that should be, but that's just my you know. If, if we all are saying, you know, people aren't going to move on the commercial charge, I would keep the 6.1. Um, if there was a move on the commercial charge to a reduction of the three and a half, um, that would be like a $3 million decline, which would be, you know, again, pretty insignificant as far as on an NPR change. Um, but that, you know, I would suggest it to drop. So I'm, I'm just, I understand what you're saying. I'm just yeah. saying that I, I think it, it presents like, okay, we approved this. 
but um, what actually happens versus what we put out there is always different, you know, so you, we, certainly we could do that, and is it gonna be a wide margin of change? Maybe not, but without having a path to say, get there by reducing, because of uh, that 0.6 reduction, I believe is about, what is it, 10 million, I'm not sure what it is, 1.25. You might have said for staff that said about seven and a half. Yeah, eight million dollars, yeah, it's just, I mean, I'm just not sure how we get there. So that's, that's a thing that I was gonna ask the staff to clarify, because I thought when um, staff made the presentation, Robin said that it would have brought it down to 5.5. Um, I thought that what the math was when staff presented it to us was that if we'd given them the 3.2 last year and then went with the uh, full amount this year, that would bring it to 5.1. Did I misunderstand? No, that's correct. The vote thing. So where does the 5.5 come from, Robin? That's where I was confused. So I don't know. <laughs> this is kind of the math we're looking at on the quick break, which is Robin's looking at their FY19 projection, which is about 1.3 million. She's adding three and a half percent to that, which brings you to about 1.1 million three hundred and forty-two thousand. So the difference between FY19. Well, I think the correct way to do the math would have been to take the previous year's budget at the 3.2, then from there at the 3.5. Am, am, am I wrong in that? I think that's a board member perspective. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, I think that's one way to look at it. If we were to say, um, what, what would they have gotten at 3.2% over 2018 to 19, and then what would you get at 3.5? That puts it about 1% um, above, I believe, roughly. Um, which would be more like 12 or 13 million dollars higher. Um, then I think the discussion becomes with everything that we've talked about with the change in you know, CMI, with, the, with showing that patients are coming in from out of the area, you know, as just as Northeastern did, do we then say that warrants a higher increase? So I think it, you know, from a pure math, yeah, from a pure math, if you look at from a roll forward from where we were from 18 to now, it's about 0.91% over, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what Robin was doing was kind of saying, if we're at where we are for 19, and we approved 3.5%, that would put them up at the 5.5%. But you know, any number, we can pick a number to reduce the top line to, but if we don't have a path to get there, um, that's a challenge as well. Yep. Oh, yeah, and I hear you. I totally hear you on the path to get there. I, I guess for me, when we approved, and we've said this last year, and it obviously wasn't completely heard by all the hospitals, mm -hmm. but when we approved the commercial change in charge, that is a maximum. And so uh, my assumption is that if, if that there would be a, a number of ways that the hospital could get to a new top line, and that I would leave it to their discretion to figure that out, um, which could include a smaller negotiating something less than 4% change in charge. Because we do allow for people to come under our approved change in charge. And I would just add that I think the path to get to the, potentially the, select, the lower NPR, I think there's multiple ways. I think that while they've estimated we know uh, significant reduction in productivity reduction in EMR and medical center because they've had epic, perhaps that's going to be uh, overly conservative. The ambulatory surgical center had some hits. I know that they, in their answers to our responses, they think they've adjusted for that adequately, but we also heard that was with their margin. So that's uh, a potential reduction that they may see in volume. Um, I, I would also just throw out there that we know there's unnecessary utilization in every system. So to the extent that there can be a management of getting rid of waste, low value care that does not need to be you know, ordered, to the extent that there is going to be EPIC that's going to reduce duplicate x-rays and duplicate uh, CAT scans as we go from the affiliate hospitals up, I think there's opportunity for the hospital to reduce unnecessary waste. I, I, I'm more concerned about 
cutting the commercial rate, even though I know it's tough and it affects affordability, it affects market for every uh, service that they do provide. I'd rather see costs reduced by getting rid of unnecessary services, low value services, waste in the system, which I think is moving to an all payer model and fixed payment, and there's incentive to do that, but has potential. I would just say that we haven't seen any evidence of carrier's ability to negotiate better rates than what this board approves. So that, that's a problematic thing for me to, to lay that out there. It's almost unfair to them. I wouldn't say the carrier would do with that. I was suggesting that UVM themselves could come in with less than 4% as a way to reach the new top line. Because I hear you, Kevin. <laughs> Can I just, just for clarification, go through the math, Agatha, a little bit? Um, so if we start at a 2018 budget level, that was $1,222,000,000. You said 2018? 2018. And I, you know, we'll have to, we'll do our best to answer this on the fly, but we'll need to look at our, our, our workbooks. But yes, please proceed. Um, and then, so multiplying that by the 3.2% guidance gets you to $1,292,000,000. Okay. Uh, That's correct. Your head. That's correct. And then, um, as I have talked to you about in this past, we have to uh, subtract some accounting adjustments from that per actions that we, we've taken that are $6.3, $6.4 million. And that brings us um, to one billion two hundred eighty-six million, and that times uh, the three and a half percent brings us to one billion three hundred thirty-one million. Um, I'm just trying to get a door. I'm not stuck on that number. I'm just trying to find, you know, follow the math. And when we went through this in hypothetical, you know, discussions, uh, there was this reduction from revenue uh, in 2020 in order to make it apples to apples of uh, 6.4 million dollars. Yeah, Tom, I'll just um, put in there. You don't need to make that adjustment because that was from the 2018 budget. I know what you're saying, but that was in the 2018 um, actuals. They had the deductions for the ACL coming out of the um, reduction to NPL. For 2019 budget, they moved it out and they moved it to expenses. For 2019 actual, they actually did it the way they had done in 2018. So, so the adjustment they made was when you look at 2019 budget to 2020 budget, but they actually implemented 2000, in 2019 in their projection the way they had done in 18. Does that make sense? So you don't need to reduce that six million. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah, I mean that the ACO, they basically, when they came last year, they said, we're going to move it from here, we're going to put it down to expenses. Mm -hmm. And then we went through all the meetings and um, discussions on ACO, and then now they said, okay, we're putting it back. It, actually, they never took it out. But when you look at budget for 19, it was reduced. There's a lot of accounting adjustments that wouldn't be in what we're talking with Tom. Right, there's some other little things. Yeah, there's a big one about that. I know it's confusing, but in the budget, they had it in the budget. And then when we look to 20, it's not there, so you have to adjust for that to make it apples to apples. But, so that's the so, really doesn't need to come out. That's where you're coming out so, with the higher number. So, so okay, so, um, so if you take that out, then you have the 6.4 million to the one million to the three hundred. Yeah. I think you actually, it's pretty clean to take the 1252 times the 1.032 times the 1.035 to get to. Um, I, I know what you're trying to say, yeah. I understand, no. but there was a lot of confusion about the ACL. I mean, my, my, you know, this, this is a very difficult decision because when you go through rate review um, and you look at these 10 and 11 and 12 percent increases, you know, and then you look at the actuarial presentations by our actuaries and the um, insurer's actuaries and they do the review mirror analysis and these expenditures get built into that. And um, so I, uh, uh, and I, I fully appreciate um, what the Medical Center has done and is doing. 
Um, you know, starting the ACO, I think, is the right path. And, um, uh, and the, you know, I'm hoping that, that the medical center right now has about 10% of its, its NPR in, in, the, in the ACO and looking to climb that to about 17% in, in 2020. And that's all good. I'm just trying to think on the affordability side. There's another constituency here that isn't here today, but that, you know, those 600 comments that we got during the review process also speak to me about, um, uh, you know, a, a, about trying to find the best balance here. And as having dealt with very large and complicated budgets um, in my life, um, I look at this, uh, even the 20, at, at $20 million, it'd be a 1.5% change. And that, to me, is a difficult lift. But people in Vermont have been there and done that. And if I look at the state budget this year, very rough comparison. But they met their general fund and transportation fund growth um, to under 3% um, this, you know, for, for 2020. So I don't know what the right number is. I, 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 as I said at the beginning, I, I'm not, this isn't, you know, this is trying to find the best balance. And I do know that every dollar that you put in here will show up in rate review and come out some small business or um, um, uh, <clears throat> individual's pocket unless we begin to address the cost shift and, and get a more level playing uh, field across all players. So um, now I have a number to compare to. Yeah. So what we your proposal relative to the dollar amount? I don't know. Okay. I rely on staff. I don't do math in public. I so I I'm just gonna throw out there. This is a you have to think about. I, I appreciate and I fully fully appreciate that um, whatever we do here in the commercial charge is going to roll into rate review. I, mean, I get that. We see that, and that's what's really painful about this. Is that I know that what we do here is going to be really painful next summer. Um, so there is a consequence of a commercial change of four percent, but there are other consequences of that if we don't allow that. And I want us to think through that as well. So the commercial rate charge is reflective of medical inflation. What underlies medical inflation? Medical inflation is caused by um, equipment and services, right? Pharmacy, drugs, a lot of these expenses are beyond the control of one hospital or one state. Um, we saw that, you know, specialty drugs and things like that. The other piece that is the, the largest component of a hospital's budget is staffing, is the people, it's the service industry, so this is really largely driven by wages. And we're in a workforce shortage. And it's very difficult for these hospitals all across the state to compete with a national market that's uh, experiencing shortages and is causing wage pressure. So I will just say that I don't. I, I can, my concern is access as well as it is affordability. And my concern would be: Do we are we uh, restricting this hospital from keeping, retaining, uh, and hiring their workforce? In a workforce shortage, it's putting upward pressure on wages, which is a large fraction of their budget. So I want to say that's another consequence that we have to think about. And I don't know the exact answer to it, but it's something that I would look at. Just on the rate review piece, uh, the one thing that I would remind us is we did have Eleni look at the difference between we went with what we historic, like they applied a historical look at what we typically had approved in budgets. To rate review, but the difference between that and the hospital budgets as filed was 0.27. So, because of the difference between the rate review population and the budgets in general, it, it, it's not a one to one. So, I would just throw that out there as a reminder not, not that you know that necessarily discounts anything that anyone has said about affordability, but we did quantify that, so I thought it was worthwhile saying the quantification. Um, if I wanted to throw out a different motion, do we have to do a senior motion? Or how do we do that? 
you, you could make a, an offer to have it be a friendly motion. If it's not accepted, you could also offer something to uh, be a substitute uh, motion. Or we could just vote mine down and move on. Uh, there's a number of different options. Uh, I mean, I, if, if I were to amend the motion and make a friendly change, I would amend it to put a 3.5% commercial charge in there, which is a $3.2 million change um, to their total number, which would bring it down to about 5.9% to 6%, depending on the rounding on the NPR. And part of that is because I understand that Miller and Epic are not supposed to be increasing the commercial rate. And things are not a one for one. So it's it's not saying, you know, we can always say, okay, I've got all these cost savings and that's up, offsetting Epic and Miller and, and these other changes. But in 2020, there are significant increases. Again, as I said, 12 million just in the depreciation for the Miller building is being absorbed now. Um, on top of that, there's millions of dollars of one-time costs for EPIC that are, is also in the number. So we would expect if that's not being absorbed at all by any commercial rate, that that's, that would all be dropping to the bottom line. And that's part of the reason, and I, I'm not gonna go through a debate because you know, we can say, okay, none of that is in there, or some of that, but those are things factoring in there. Um, I think putting a, a small change, and you know, I was, I could have gone down as low as three, but I think putting a three and a half percent in there, which is about three million dollars, you know, at least recognizes the fact that um, we're coming in, you know, twenty-six million dollars over an NPR from nineteen budget to nineteen projection. And I know we can address that in enforcement, but by the time we do enforcement, that is, you know, in March and six months has recurred during the year. And I'm not saying we won't do anything in enforcement, but I'm just saying, you know, it, it's, I think to, to also not acknowledge that there's, you know, significant overages in the budget from last year and to make, you know, some type of adjustment, um, which I think a $3 million adjustment on a budget that has $1.448 billion in expenses you know, and we have not pushed farther saying cost savings. I know the hospital, I know the network looks at all these cost savings, but you know, I just think it would be um, consistent with some of the things we've done in the past. So that's what I would put out there as an a, either an amendment or something just get people need that. So I just want to clarify that you're moving to. Uh, Kevin, why don't I withdraw my motion and then we can talk about Maureen's motion and then we can always. Okay. Why don't I do that? That seems pointless. Okay, so does the seconder withdraw as well? Yes. So, Maureen, I need some clarification because you threw out, I think, two different numbers on NPR. Sure. I just want to make sure. I no, so my motion would be that we um, put a change in charge instead of a 4% commercial to a 3.5% commercial change in charge which if the calculation of the 1% equals 6.2, that would be about a little over $3 million reduction to the NPR, which would bring the NPR, NPR down to, I think it's like 5.93, but it could end up rounding whether that rounds to six or to, but to 5.9, so that we would approve a 5.9% NPR change with a 3.5% commercial change um, with the additional recommendations to um, report on the implementation and um, whether we say take out review charge and change of charge or we still have review uh, 2019 at enforcement. So is there a second to the motion? So this could be a long day. <laughs> I'll second for purpose of discussion. Well, I guess one of the challenges that I'm having is we're not hearing from everybody on where they want to be, and we've thrown out a 4% commercial charge, we've thrown out a 3.5% commercial charge, we've thrown out keeping, you know, the, the 6.1, so I'm just trying to get, I guess, where everybody's at to understand, um, you know, what the other options would be. Okay, there's been a motion and a second to approve an NPR increase of 5.9% commercial rate uh, 
change of 3.5 um, when we will report on impacts of EPIC implementation. Is there further discussion? So my preference would be to just to move forward from that 2018 base by 3.2 percent and 3.5 percent, but that's that's my perfect world. And so that takes us to the one one billion two hundred and thirty seven million, which is I think uh, which is fourteen million dollars um, uh, difference there. Um, um, so that would be uh, about a percent and a half on the commercial rate because the goal is to take the pressure off the commercial rates. Um, and I, you know, I, I just know that 14 and a half million dollars on a budget of, of, of 1.337 is readily achievable. But when, when that rolls into the rate review process, um, it's a relatively big number. Um, um, so a $3 million type, um, just, uh, I, think, I think we can do more than that. Um, and it's actually kind of cut that lead to use a huge increase year over year um, in terms of, uh, of, of, of the dollar value. Um, I will note that at, at the quarter hearing, um, it's clear that, that UVM is, uh, recognizes this. Um, you know, the UVM folks said this is also the, about the quarter rate. This is also the lowest commercial rate increase that we have incorporated into our budget in over 10 years. More generally, they said we continue to self-impose these lower rate increases on our commercial payers in order to have to drive down the cost of care in the state. And I, you know, these these increments happen in small measure, but when they happen year after year after year, they build up into something significant. So um, I don't think I can support any, and you know, can be a four to one vote or four to two or whatever it's going to be. I don't. I, I think we can do better than that. Well, it's not going to be four to two unless you've added another member of the board in my absence. Pardon? Yeah. It won't be a four to two vote unless you've added another no, 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 member no, of the board. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I would just say to that. So, so, so sad my math can be. I guess I would just say to your uh, to your logic, Tom. Um, uh, if you take the, the math that you're doing, the 3.2 and the 3.5. I'm sorry. Your, to your math, the logic I have to follow that um, if you take the 2018 and you say, okay, if we had allowed in 3.2 and then we had allowed in 3.5, it would be within the budget guidance. Um, and I guess I would say to you then that all of the other extenuating circumstances that they presented at hearing 
that we're not compelling to you, that you just want to stick with the box that we gave you. And I, I would just argue that I think we give guidance, but I think we also, at hearing, expect that individual hospitals are going to have individual circumstances that allow us to deviate from guidance if we find that evidence compelling. And so I would ask you what evidence that they provided do you not find compelling such that you could say, let's just stick to the guidance. So the unique patient IDs that came in that suggest that you know, more patients are seeing, seeking care at EVM than had previously. So that must not have been compelling to you. Or you know, the case mix index change or other types of evidence that suggested that there is more volume, there's more aging of the population, there's more people moving to treatment in China, there's more people using the services there. To stick to the guidance would say that we don't think that those extenuating circumstances are compelling. So I guess I would ask you that. Is, is that evidence not compelling? Or well, what else, how else can you stay within the guidance and not see individual circumstances here? Well, I mean, we've established that guidance um, in the all pair model. I mean, it goes back to that. And the all pair model is, is uh, based not on a measure of um, uh, health care insurance cost is based on a uh, economic network in the state economy gross, gross state product and that's more of a type of affordability and in recognition that uh, health care costs inflation is higher um, so I'm aware of that and I'm trying to come down on the side of affordability um, and think that an institution the size of UVM Medical Center um, who are trying to do great things in terms of population health and bring people together to become more efficient, you know, are, are positioning themselves to beat the uh, medical, the national kind of uh, medical in, in inflation and metric. Um, but I also realize that there's a lot of noise in the system. I mean, last year, the 2019 budget was a $19 million increase, and they missed that by $23 million. Bucks. Um, so it, it's... Uh, I just feel um, that if, if uh, the leadership of, of UVM Medical Center said, you know, we can find $14 million uh, in the system, I believe that they could do that. That is not a big leap. Um, and I then see that $14 million filtering back to the rate review system and being a, a direct, although immeasurable, but direct benefit to um, um, uh, to people that have to person, you know, purchase insurance through a small group or individual. Uh, that, that's how the system works. So, I, I mean, there's a lot of noise in this system. 2019, it, it's not that we imposed um, that uh, $19 million increase on them. It, that was their proposal and we accepted it. And we find that that was a miss of by 23 million, which is a huge percentage. So, um, I know that they, 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 they had to find 14 million bucks that could do it. And uh, it's, it's, it's a small percentage of, of, of it. So what we're asking, uh, basically, we cut the rate, uh, the commercial rate increase, and it would still be an increase. It would still be a $30, $40 million increase. So we're not talking about cutting the budget. We're talking about how much it grows. So I have two responses. One is the, the, your reference to the all-payer model in 3.5. That's exactly why I think we need, need to move to the total cost of care per capita uh, metric, because Yes, it's three and a half percent, but that's for the entire system. And if people are moving and voting with their feet to one hospital service area, then they are going to exceed that cap, and we should see declines elsewhere. And so, I, and to some degree, I think it's important for us to move to a total cost of care per capita metric if we really truly want to be aligned with the all payer model because we're seeing more volume, and so that's going to drive up NPR. And that's not misaligned with the all payer model if, in fact, if they capture the total cost of care per capita, it's still in line with the like um, if I can just comment on that. Yeah, yeah. I said uh, I said that in the very hearing. Um, I I thought what uh, UVM put on the table in terms of case mix and new patients is it was the right thing to do at the wrong time. It was in the middle of a process. Mm -hmm. And I because I think it is kind of a zero sum game and until you have all the hospitals at the table, and this is something Bosch I think should do, have them all at the table to address case mix issues, to address um, and you need patient interviews between uh, patients. Also to address the cost shift and, and um, uh, the payer mix. Um, those, are, those are problems that need to be solved on a system-wide basis, and uh, we're not going to solve them every day. I guess the other piece I'd say is the $14 million that you're proposing. Um, 
I would just like to know what are the consequences. You said they can cut it. I'd like to know what they're going to cut. What does that mean for access and quality? How are they going to cut that? And, and we need to, it's the, yeah, it's the three legs. We care about affordability. We also care about access and quality. And so what would the consequences of that be in terms of access and quality? And that's what I would need to understand. Well, I'm, I'm not the budget director for the UVA Medical Center, so I can't tell you. But, I know. Uh, as a but I just want to be, I want to be sure that making decisions. As a regulator, the magnitude of that reduction in terms of their budget is not that much. The magnitude in terms of the request from Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, or MVP, in terms of their increases, um, it's a significant number. So I'll go back to what I said at the beginning of this process. I think. Uh, this is a year with some very tough uh, decisions to make. And it's unfortunate that the largest is last. And I do worry, and I continue to worry, even though I voted for uh, the decisions that have been made, that at times we um, are rewarding smallness and inefficiency at the expense of trying to create a system that is right sized and affordable for the monitors. With that being said, Tom, there's just no way I could go down to 2.5. I worry about uh, a lot of the testimony that we received. UVM fought tenaciously to improve their bond rating. I don't want to jeopardize that. Um, they have been incredible leaders in the movement away from fee for service to value based medicine. And uh, I don't want to get in the way of that further success. I don't want to get in the way of creating an access problem for the monitors. I do think, though, that um, a slight reduction in the commercial charge could be in order and basically uh, that reduction is only going to lower the NPR to whether it's 5.93 or 5.9. Uh, you know, I think that uh, it's going to, going to be hard for UVM to even meet that. They've got tremendous pressures on them and their trends. You know, the real trick is going to be to try to figure out um, not just unique patients, but being able to get to that total cost of care for uh, a patient, whether it's done at UVM or a combination of UVM and, and two other Vermont hospitals or one other Vermont hospital or what have you. And at the end of the day, the total cost of care um, well, this hospital service area is at the low end. Even though I do recognize the fact that they have better demographics than the rest of the state. Um, so we really do have to look at a risk-adjusted uh, total cost of care. But I, I don't think that the motion that's on the table is out of line. I probably would have gone at 3.75% on the commercial just to send a message. Well, I don't think uh, the difference between the 3.5 and the 3.75 would be insurmountable. I'm sure that people from UVM would tell me that I'm off base there, but uh, that's what I'm thinking. So, um, can I move the question on um, uh, Maurice? Uh, just because we could talk about this all day long. And, uh, well, I, I think that, you know, <laughs> we still haven't gone to the public yet. Um, I'm not sure how much more is left to be said, but you, you, could, you could make that motion. I, I would hate to um, hinge upon debate from the board, but if that's the motion you wish to make, you can. No, I just, want, I just want to know something. I, I don't have anything more to say, and I know, I, I know how I'm going to vote, but, um, but we do have to hear from the public, and yep. um, I, I just, you know, this is all process and yep. you know, wasting people's time, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you for Is there further discussion from the board? If not, I'll open it up to the public. Yes, Dale. 
This is really complicated to understand. Um, I said that before and people say it many more times. I get concerned with this one. I'm going to try to use an example. I think that's the easiest way to explain it. I go to Central Vermont Hospital. That's a small hospital. And I use Fletcher Allen Healthcare up there. That's where my primary care is. I needed a surgical procedure. And at that point, I was referred to a doctor within Central Vermont Hospital practice. Nine months later, we still can't get it scheduled and accomplished. It was rescheduled three times, utilizing Central Vermont Hospital's surgical facilities. I finally called up and I said, okay, not happening, is there another option? They sent me to Fletcher Allen. Six weeks later, it's done. What I've never been able to figure out is what was happening behind the scenes that made it happen with Fletcher Allen in six weeks. It couldn't be done in nine months through Central Vermont Hospital. This is where I'm going to, is it doctors retiring that weren't carrying a full utilization caseload? Is it, um, what, is it a reimbursement rate? Does universe, um, no, does Flet, University of Vermont, I keep saying Fletcher Allen, pay a better reimbursement rate? They have more time at the surgical units than Central Vermont Medical Hospital doctors do. These are the things that when you're making these decisions, how are you affecting that kind of distribution of care? Both practice in that surgical unit. I ended up with Fletcher Allen. How does that relate to net patient revenue did it subtract from the Central Vermont net patient revenue? Did it add to University of Vermont net patient revenue? What was my cost? What did University of Vermont pay for the, the use of the surgical unit? And uh, Medicaid, so what was the reimbursement right there? These are the things that when you're making all these decisions, I start asking myself what that looks like for the patient, and I don't know how to get them connected. Is there another comment from the public? Yes. I think I the healthcare advocate. Um, I first wanted to say I really appreciate all of the good discussion by the board and the time that you're taking to carefully go through all of this. So, um, so it's with respect that I say, which comes as no surprise, that our office supports a reduction in a commercial rate. Um, a lot of these points have been made by the board, but um, but we heard over 600 comments in the review process about the crisis of inaffordability in Vermont with commercial rates. Um, I. I understand the points about um, comparing the commercial rate to medical inflation, but if that's a national benchmark, um, and you know that medical inflation is, is unaffordable nationwide, and I believe that uh, the goals of our, of our um, healthcare system should be to, to be better than that, to, to try to make things as affordable as possible for Vermonters, especially when our um, income is not necessarily keeping up uh, with nationwide numbers. Um, as was said, uh, my understanding is that the um, CONs for Miller and Epic were on the basis of them not, not affecting the commercial rate. And so those being given as reasons to, um, to keep a higher commercial rate uh, doesn't seem, seem in line with um, what we're trying to do. I also uh, believe that the investments in mental health capacity came from um, from correcting for UVM over reaching their budget in the past. And um, and I agree with what's been said that they have a history of, of overshooting their budgets and so allowing them 
the 4% commercial increase um, is likely to perpetuate that. And then finally, I, although I appreciate what they've been saying about their increase in patient volume um, leading to higher NPRs, um, I think that can be seen as an opportunity to increase, um, to leverage that to increase efficiencies. And a reason why that plus their positive um, payer mix, why they don't need as high of a commercial increase is as what maybe some other hospitals um, reasonably need. Um, and finally, I, I agree with what was said that, um, that we have no evidence that there are strong negotiations that happen um, when it, between the hospitals and the commercial payers. And, um, and instead, what we've seen gotten over and over again from the hospital <coughs> statements that, that they believe their commercial rate is what's been given to them. It's, it's, it's the board saying that it's reasonable. Thank you. Thank you. Other members of the public? John? Just a couple. I'm sorry, can you say your name? John Bromstead. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, the uh, potential probable uh, uh, investment in inpatient psychiatry is going to be four times what the overall four times. And to look at the growth of cost. Even if you don't want to change the metric, the true growth in the cost of care for UVM Medical Center, it's in the budget area. If you look at the number of unique patients and you do just very modest risk adjustment based on CMI and uh, age, it's two and a half percent. It's way below what um, medical inflation is nationally. We're already performing at that level, and I just want to make it the point on the record that to pull just a percentage of the uh, member Holmes point um, and uh, have it on a percentage basis and not look at it in a per capita basis is just doesn't make sense and is contrary to what we're trying to do with the all care model. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, as I understand the motion, the motion is to approve University of Vermont Medical Center's budget with a NPR of 5.9%, a commercial rate charge of 3.5%, and a request to uh, report on uh, any implementation impacts from EPIC. <laughs> I might suggest a friendly amendment on the reporting to be consistent with the other hospitals we indicated they should notify us of any impact. Is that, I don't know if that's friendly or not. I think it's friendly, to, but I, I can't speak for more. <laughs> that's friendly, yes. <laughs> and who was the second? That was you, Robin, so you're okay. I'm okay. I agree with myself. Okay. <laughs> Does everybody understand the motion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am opposed. So that would be a no. That would be a no. Yeah. Okay. So with that, um, I believe that is all the hospitals. And because it is noon time, I normally would say let's break for lunch, but I know that um, we probably could get finished in a, a fairly reasonable amount of time. And uh, rather than call everybody back, I think it would be good if we just move to uh, old business and new business. So is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business? Number Holmes. Yes, okay. So I just wanted to um, have some conversation around the sustainability trend. As um, we all know, we've been through this, I've, I've added this language to some of the motions for some of the hospitals that were suffering from some financial strain, asking those hospitals to uh, submit a sustainability plan. And uh, Robin had mentioned, you know, the idea of also having a, having a working group that the Green Mountain Care Board would facilitate uh, 
with those hospitals to figure out what framework might be in that sustainability plan, what would be reasonable for them to be able to do and the timeline in which they could do it and have them be a part of the process of designing what a sustainability plan look like. So I thought I would just throw out some ideas that I have here today for what sustainability plans might look like uh, for some of these small struggling hospitals. The questions that I'm hoping that they can answer to get some feedback from the board. And then obviously that would then plant the seeds for this working group and the boss to start to do that. So uh, again, this was uh, kind of throwing this together uh, yesterday. So th these are my initial thoughts and I'll caveat that with initial thoughts. Um, but again, this, what we're thinking about here is these small struggling hospitals, largely, and many of them having had operating margins that are negative. So really helping us to understand what is their plan to move out of the red and into the black. So you know, one bucket is let's think about asking them to think about how they can uh, move from you know, red to black in the future, thinking about their charge requests, if they've exceeded medical inflation for at least three of the past five years. How might the hospital initiate cost savings initiatives to ensure that sustainability um, at or below medical inflation? So asking them to think about shared services, shared workforce, standardizing supplies, group purchasing, centralized control, supply ordering. What are the obstacles and opportunities that these hospitals face in trying to keep their costs uh, at or near medical inflation and getting those margins into the black? Also asking them specifically to think about what are their ways that they can reduce their reliance on other revenue. So we know 340D is what's keeping many of these hospitals from red to black. If 340D goes away tomorrow, which given you know federal changes all the time is possible, how will the hospitals achieve a positive operating margin? What is their plan B? If the economy took a downturn and investment income or donations declined, again, what is their plan B? What is the way in which they're gonna a positive operating margin. So those are one bucket of areas that I would like the hospitals to come up with some solutions to a path forward for that. Um, also, as I've mentioned in, in many of these hearings and our conversations, I also want hospitals to be looking at their service lines and identifying cost centers. And again, I would bucket that into three areas, cost, quality, and access. Um, the goal is for the hospitals to start to do the hard work of ensuring that care is being delivered at the hospital and their outpatient clinics that it's appropriate, cost effective, and high quality. So let me just share the buckets. If I think about costs, I would want the hospitals to be asking me, are we as a hospital able to offer the service at an affordable price? So there's a couple of approaches I think that could be taken here. All hospitals have to post their charge masters, right, on the Department of Health website. So it's gross charges. I recognize that's not the same thing as reimbursements, but um, Action PP requires the Department of Health to collect and post those charges. So one approach would be for hospitals to identify the services for which they're charging more than a standard deviation above the state median and justify that high cost, right? What is driving that high cost of care? Could it be lowered or should that care be delivered somewhere else more cost effectively? Another approach would be to look at all services whose commercial reimbursement is greater than some number. I don't have the number right here, but let's say it's uh, more than 175% of Medicare, right? There's some amount that we could agree on perhaps and look at. Again, if those services are being offered at some significant percentage above Medicare, again, are those high costs justified or should that care be delivered somewhere else at, at lower cost? And then again, by service line or department, I would like to see hospitals examine and report on areas where the marginal revenue they're taking in for those services is less than the marginal cost. That doesn't require fixed cost allocation. It's looking at the margin, looking at marginal analysis. So where are they losing money on the margin in which departments? And again, assess that. That's the cost bucket. I think they also have to start thinking about the quality bucket. Is the volume high enough to support their service lines at a high quality level? We know, and I've talked about this in hearings, that volume and health outcomes are related. The literature is pretty clear that for certain procedures, Patients in low volume hospitals experience more adverse events, right? So not only do the hospitals need the practice, but the support teams need the practice. So I would ask hospitals to look at the volumes. And you know, it was interesting. If you look at the Act 53 data that's posted also on the Department of Health website, we have hospitals performing low volumes of procedures. There are a few of our struggling hospitals that are performing a combined 30 to 60 hip or knee replacements a year combined 30 to 60, which suggests if you split it half and half, it's 15 to 30 hip and knee replacements a year. 
Germany does not want a hospital do a knee replacement if their surgical volume is less than 50. So we need to be thinking about that. Hospitals need to be thinking about that. We need to be looking at their low volume services. I suspect that areas where they have low volume, they may not always cover those fixed costs. The two may be related. So I think we need to be thinking about that, or hospitals need to be thinking about that. And then I would ask them to reflect on access, that last bucket. What services are critical to delivery close to home? And what services, given what that analysis they've just done, could be more cost effectively delivered or higher quality elsewhere? So again, looking at the services that they find are relatively high cost and or services that are relatively low volume in that analysis, are those services that need to be done close to home or could they be done somewhere else at either a lower cost or at a higher quality? Um, you know, could they be considering transportation, right, as an option to get the, the care that they need for the patients in their community? Could vans be bought, you know, and, and, and could transportation help that? Uh, could they be increasing reliance on, reliance on telemedicine? I don't know, but these are the types of questions that I would hope the hospitals would be doing. Many of them already are. We heard that in the hearings. We heard them talking about service line assessments. I know they're doing strategic planning. So many, much of this work is probably already being done. But I think for the sake of the sustainability of the hospital system, we need to have we need more information about that. So that's what I was thinking about would be in a sustainability plan. So I don't I, I throw that out there again with my thoughts from last night. It's just a plant to seed for conversation. And I know this is uh, a pretty tough day to uh, have a, a real thorough conversation because the hospitals for the most part I believe are at a meeting today. Um, Mike, this, this is totally unfair, Mike Del Treco, but um, do you have any thoughts on a sustainability plan? Uh, <laughs> Sorry to do that to you. Yeah, Paul, so Mike Del Treco from the Hospital Association. First of all, uh, really uh, tough deliberations, thoughtful process, appreciate it, uh, not easy stuff. Uh, I think. Um, related to long-term sustainability plan, consistency, uh, a consistent way to approach um, um, uh, how hospitals could do with these things that would be a foundation that we should work from. Many of the things that were discussed could be part of that foundation. There might be additional things to add, um, uh, plans for uh, partnerships, things of that nature, what partnerships look like. Um, so certainly, uh, my thoughts, my immediate thoughts is consistency um, and something we should uh, uh, talk more about offline and work with our membership and, and, and come up with some discussion points. Okay, thoughts from the board? Yeah, I would just chime in. Um, that, what Justice said and what Mike said makes sense to me. I think there will also be some recommendations that eventually come out of the Rural Health Services Task Force around probably specifically telemedicine and workforce that could be helpful additions to the conversation. So um, I like the idea of working, having you know, the working group kind of come up with a consistent approach and um, being able to make sure those processes are consistent as well. Um, I did want to note that in uh, Ba's letter, the specific question that was asked was uh, whether we could clarify the relationship between the long range planning and how they relate to the monthly or bi monthly reports that we've been talking about. And to me, they're related in the sense that uh, the monthly or bi monthly reports are monitoring, particularly on hospitals where we're worried about their short term financial as well as their long term, but really that's a short term looking process to make sure that we're doing our due diligence as the regulator to keep an eye on the hospitals that we know are having trouble. Whereas the sustainability planning is really meant to ensure that we're looking longer term and that, that there would be an understanding that it would take some time for hospitals to pivot and, and start to move towards a different operational structure, if you will, if that's where it leads, whether that's affiliations or service line adjustments or whatever. Um, but that that would may or may not address kind of some of the more immediate short term. That's how I've been thinking about that, but I thought it might be helpful to just throw that out there. Mike. Um, so so I uh, could 
I agree with what was being discussed. One of the things that the other thing we outlined in this letter, sort of our concern around the administrative components with all of this. Uh, not that it's new work, um, but it's added work, and I would really uh, ask the board to consider what goes away in the guidance. Uh, are, are questions eliminated that this, um, that uh, by, by adding this work to the process, are questions eliminated? What does the guidance turn into? Is this more part of a budget requirement? Is it an offline requirement? But, but, I, but I really want to impress upon the board that many of our members are, probably most all of our members are thoroughly strapped with the ongoing budget process throughout the year. I'm not saying it's not important. We understand the, the context and why it happens. It's just very difficult for some of our, our uh, members to manage this on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I hear everything that you've said, and I don't think that uh, you know this is something that can be turned around quickly as far as a thorough plan. On the flip side of that, though, I do think that um, every hospital is working on this. And if the board isn't discussing their sustainability, then there's a problem about that board, too. Mm -hmm. So, other thoughts from the board members? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I, was, I just wanted to agree with that I think this is a, you know, a good plan adjustment bringing forward. And you know, this is more strategic about where are we going with these hospitals in the future? And, um, you know, I think it was in your discussion, but, you know, I'd also say, obviously, efficiencies and cost savings need to be a big focus. We keep kind of leaning on medical inflation, but um, we can't keep raising rates to offset medical inflation without gaining those efficiencies. And the other thing, though, to hospitals, um, what their payer mix is, is a factor to the, you know, some of the hospitals that have a really low commercial payer mix, it's really hard for them to make up that medical inflation on the Medicaid, Medicare, and so they may end up having a higher request. But some of the hospitals that have a much higher reliance on commercial, you know, that's a way to get some of those down. So, you know, that might be a factor for a hospital that's over the amount every year on a commercial ask. Um, Sometimes it's a small contributor to their bottom line, but because of the payer mix. But I think um, I think just the whole plan, and I also think it will feed into the you know health, health resource allocation plans that are being done, and the World Task Force, and that you know all of these can kind of come together with the input from the hospitals themselves on where they're going, and where their boards think they're going, and that you know, they should be driving all of this, really, right? Their boards should be looking at this and trying to say, how are you going to be sustainable, particularly with the hospitals that are financially challenged with one under bankruptcy, and that could happen to others if things don't turn around. So speaking of sustainable, I just want to throw this out there that I'm not looking at medical inflation. I'm looking at economic inflation. And we weren't part of the negotiations, but I think that Vermont kind of promised more than just medical inflation in the agreement that they signed with the federal government. And I'd at least try to see us adhere to promises made by our predecessors. If I could just, one of the ways in which I think we hope that we're going to adhere to a uh, 3.5% growth rate is by actually changing the underlying volume. Medical inflation is, is largely determined by a lot of forces in the marketplace um, that are maybe beyond providers' control, uh, but what is in their control, which is what the Alpine model does, is volume and getting rid of waste, duplicative services, you know, that don't, need, that don't actually improve people's health. So that's the volume piece that I really want to see brought down. Um, because that is within the provider control and we need to value based payment. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't want to, for, I don't want to cut short the discussion, but I did want to just have a brief announcement if you are ready to move on to yeah. related, but. I just wanted feedback from this idea because I knew I threw it out there and I, you know, as a, um, a condition on these budgets and I wanted to see if people thought that this direction was the right one to start having those conversations with health people. And since we can't talk offline, <laughs> oh, yeah. there it is. Yep. 
So uh, the announcement that I wanted to just make is, um, which I have done once before and will do again as it gets closer, but November 21st is National Rural Health Day. The Department of Health is planning a, a celebration in uh, St. Johnsbury, which will be held at the Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital. Uh, we're still locking down the time of when the celebration piece will be, but we will also have a Rural Health Services Task Force meeting from one to three at the hospital, and that will be designed as more of a listening session, so that's also a great opportunity for other hospitals around the state to participate in, um, or at not just hospitals, but other providers as well, to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities and good work that they're doing. Okay, any other new business to come before the board? <clears throat> if not, I want to thank everyone for, oh, Susan. Are, are you gonna entertain comment on the hospital sustainability discussion that we just had? Sure. Um, Can you say your name, I'm sorry. Yeah, Susan Aronoff um, from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. I think it would be an um, interesting section to have the hum hospitals comment on um, sustainability and the relationship to the, their participation in the all-payer model, uh, whether in general or by each payer of the program, and get a flavor of what the challenges and opportunities are. Because as I read the narratives, it seemed like a number of the hospitals were commenting about what a stretch it is and hearing the testimony, you know, there's the snafus with Medicare, et cetera. Mm -hmm. but, um, you guys kind of are acting as if there's going to be a renewal, you know, in three years. We're halfway through the first uh, chunk of the agreement. So I, th I think hearing from the hospitals now, in terms of sustainability, some section um, going forward, is this an added stressor or a benefit? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, is there any other public comment at this time? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. And before I uh, call the question, I did want to uh, publicly thank our team. Um, you've been outstanding in this process and have uh, really made us proud of all the hard work and good outputs that you have produced. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you.